Okay, testing. All right, looks like we're good there. All right. So much to do. Give me just a minute. Good morning. You want to find your ID badge and just have a seat anywhere where there's folks. Um, okay, we can do that. The store isn't open right yeah, now, but we can do that on break. So okay. You're fine. Yeah, you're fine. The first day is fine. Okay, we'll be starting in about three or four minutes. We gotta wait for everybody else to get here. Um, bathroom is just beyond the archway on the right if anybody needs to go. Um, other than that, feel free to get to know each other. I'll be right with you. <laughs> That's fine. You can ask if anybody needs them. Okay. That would be fine. Good morning. ID badge is there on the table oh. if you want to find a, a seat. Guys, I have a, like a little notebook and pens in the car for the company I work for. If somebody wants one, I can go there and grab. Okay. I'll be right back then. Just what? Who else needs? No. Two. Good morning. Good morning. You can find your ID badge on the table there and just have a seat anywhere where there's books. I'll be starting in just a few moments. Okay.
in your sign-in sheet here, guys. Hold on one second. Waiting on two. That was very nice. Thank you. So this is your uh, sign-in sheet. This has your name and email address on it. Please verify that both are correct, okay? Um, if I've made a mistake on your name or your email, cross it out and write in your very best handwriting <laughs> um, what the correction is so that we can make sure you get your after-class wrap-up emails each day and that the name on your certificate is printed correctly. Sound good? Yep. Looks like I'm waiting on two here. All right. Okay, good morning. So we are live streaming um, to all platforms. So we're on Facebook and YouTube and LinkedIn and wherever else I'm streaming to, I don't know. Um, so uh, please kind of keep that in mind, you know, when we're having discussions that it is being live streamed, but that does allow you guys to remote in if you're unable to attend live. We also will send you the link for the replays at the end of each class. So you'll be able to go back because I'm going to go over a lot of information and um, you're probably only going to pick up about 70% of what I say. That's, you know, statistically. Um, so it allows you to review that information as well once, you know, today is over. Okay. So kind of keep that in mind. This is the book that we're going to be working with. So all of you guys that are joining us live. If you do not have that book, you probably need to order it because that's the book that we're going to be working out of uh, in this class. Thank you. 
Let me get it set up. Okay, so welcome. Welcome. My name is Patricia Laramie, and I'm going to be your guide on this journey. We're going to make it super easy, and you're going to have all the information that you need to pass the CNA state exam on the first try. We're going to go over both theory and skills. But theory and skills in the real world are integrated. It's not, nobody's going to stop you in the hallway and ask you what the signs of a urinary tract infection are that you should be reporting to the nurse. Right? Nobody's going to stop you in the hallway and ask you that. You need to know that information to effectively care for the patient. So the way that I teach is that the theory and the skills are together. It makes it make sense to you. It also helps you remember what's important as you go through your daily tasks with each patient. Sound good? Okay. So a little bit about me so that you know who's standing up here teaching you. My name is Patricia Laramie. I am an RN. Um, I've been a nurse for, we're not going to say, it's a long time. <laughs> Longer than a lot of you have been on this planet. <laughs> um, I've been in full-time education now for 15 years. I developed the process that we're going to be using in class. So um, everything that I use as proprietary was developed by me here, including the book. Um, so this book is being used by schools all over the country. It's being used by the largest hospital group in their internal training. It's being used by um, government organizations. So we're, we're very, very, I know we're in Spring Hill, right? Little tiny Spring Hill. But we're very, very big out there. Um, but what that means to you is that I've got a lot of experience. I'm also a subject matter expert in prometric testing. So I'm going to give you a lot of information about the test and how to pass the test on the first try. Um, and what the, the material that we're going to be presenting is effective. It works. Okay. Um, so normally I go around and ask you guys who you are and what brought you to class, but with such a big class, I don't want to take that time, unfortunately, because we got a lot to cover. Um, but just real quick, is everybody here for CNA? Everybody is here for CNA. Okay, good. good. Just want to make sure before we get started. All right. So the very first thing that we're going to do, I'm going to start you off with a video. Now, I don't show very many videos in class, but this one is super important because it's going to lay the foundation of everything that we're going to learn from here on out throughout the entire program. So, you know, if you fall asleep through the other videos, that's fine. This is the one you don't want to fall asleep in, okay, because it really is super, super important. Um, it is me. It's my video. You're going to hear my voice, but it's in an animated format to make it a little bit more visually appealing. But it also has um, everything that I say in little bubbles so that you can follow along if um, you're more of a visual learner. Okay. So I try to cover all bases with all learning styles. So let's go ahead and um, watch this video. The, you don't have to take notes in this book. The spiral book. Spiral book is yours. You can write in it. You can color it. You can eBay it. You can do whatever you want to with it. It is yours. So you can take notes. But I've already taken the notes for you. And you're going to find the notes for this lesson on page 18 of that book. So let me get this video queued up. care plan and the CNA, why it's always about the care plan. A presentation brought to you by ForYourCNA.com. Thank you for joining For Your CNA's online CNA test prep. We will be preparing you for both the written and skills portion of the exam. This course contains videos, interactive lessons, activities, testing care plans, test registration instructions, practice questions, and much more. 
This program goes way beyond our skills videos available on YouTube. But in order to pass the test, there is one single principle that you must understand. The importance of the care plan. Without this key, learning the skills is meaningless. You might be able to mimic what I do in the skills later, but chances are you will fail the test because you didn't follow the care plan. So this course will teach you the skills, but you must first learn how those skills need to be done. So come on inside and I'll explain to you how the care plan works and why it is so important to the test. We are sure that you will become great CNAs and you will provide excellent care for our residents. But before you get started, let's review some basics. Does anyone know what the initials CNA stand for? Certified Nursing Assistant? That's exactly right, April. A nursing assistant is there to assist the nurse. You will be receiving all of your instructions from the nurse and must follow their directions. This will probably include taking vital signs and assisting with personal care tasks. But you may also be asked to assist with other nursing procedures as well. It is important to only do the things that you have been trained to do. If you aren't sure how to do something, ask someone for help. It's okay to not know everything. But please, don't try to do something that you aren't familiar with. It might harm the patient. In this online CNA test prep program, we're going to show you how to do all tested skills. But that is only the beginning of your education. You will learn way more on the job. Because every patient is different and will have a different way that those skills need to be done. And that's where the care plan comes in. As a CNA, you will be expected to assist our patients with many routine tasks. Generally speaking, CNAs help patients with things that they can no longer do for themselves. Things like sleeping, toileting, grooming, bathing, dressing, eating, socializing, and activities. Together, these are called the Activities of Daily Living, or ADLs. These are things that everyone does every day for a healthy life. But not all patients will be able to do these things for themselves because of illness or injury. Sometimes people are too weak to go to the bathroom on their own or feed themselves. And that's where you come in. If a patient needs help with any of these tasks, you will be there to help them. But not all patients will need help with all tasks. This is Henry. Henry had a stroke and has right-sided paralysis. And this is Martha. She had a left hip replacement. This is Bob. He has had a recent leg amputation. And Annie has dementia. And they will all require different care. Some patients will need help brushing their teeth, but others will do that themselves. As a CNA, we will help the patients do the things that they cannot do alone but we will let them continue to do the things for themselves that they can do. How will I know what I'm supposed to do with each patient? I'm so glad you asked, Cassie. As the registered nurse caring for these patients, that's my job. When a patient gets admitted to our facility, I will do a head-to-toe assessment. I will review all body systems to evaluate the patient for real problems and potential problems. This is a very long, complicated process, but here's a brief overview of a general assessment. I'm going to look at his neurological status. I'm going to look at his cardiac status and his respiratory system. I will also look at his integumentary system, which is hair, skin, and nails, and his gastrointestinal system. His urinary system is important, as is his musculoskeletal system. And then I will review his endocrine, lymphatic, and reproductive systems. And finally, I will review the doctor's orders for this patient. I will use all of this information to determine the patient's real and potential problems. Here's an example to put it into perspective. Let's say that this patient has just had a right hip replacement. Now we know that she will need to continue her activities of daily living. She still has to eat, drink, go to the bathroom, bathe, groom, and dress. And after my assessment, I know that she did all of those things herself until today. However, she cannot get out of bed for any reason for the next three days. So, since we know that she must stay in bed, I have to figure out how to meet all of her ADL needs. The easiest way to evaluate basic needs is using the TEAMS method. 
toileting, eating, ADLs, mobility, and special. As the RN, I'll take all the information I gathered during the assessment to figure out the best way to help her. She can't get out of bed, so I have to figure out the best way to meet her elimination needs, bedpan or catheter. I also know she is at risk for constipation. Since she's not moving much and she's on pain medication, this is a potential problem. She can feed herself, but the trays must be brought to her in bed. She can't sit all the way up because of surgery, but she can't eat lying flat either. She has dentures, so they must be within reach at mealtimes, and they must be cleaned daily. She's able to clean herself as long as the supplies are brought to her, but she can't reach her legs or feet, so she'll need help. She is on total bed rest for three days, and she also needs her dressing changed every day. You can see how the RN uses all the information available to create a plan of care specifically for this patient. This is called a care plan, and it's something that only an RN can do. Of course, this was a simplified version of the care planning process. A real patient's care plan is much more extensive. Every single aspect of her health, condition, and ability level will be evaluated in order to help her. Even the smallest decision can have long-term consequences. The RN will write a detailed care plan for the entire healthcare team to follow, and the care plan must be followed exactly. So every patient will have a different care plan? That's correct, Ben. Every care plan will be different because every patient will be different. Even patients that seem alike because they have a similar diagnosis or have had the same surgery may have differences in care. CNAs don't have enough education or experience to know all the differences. So as a CNA, your job is to read and follow the care plan for every individual patient. In fact, you could say that your job is to follow the care plan, the whole care plan, and nothing but the care plan. Do you think you can do that? Can you follow directions exactly? I can. Absolutely. Sure, yes. Awesome. Then you're well on your way to being a great CNA. But helping patients with ADLs isn't all that you will do. You are also there to help the nurses by making observations. The CNAs are the hands and the feet of the patient. If the patient is cold and cannot reach their sweater, you will get it for them. If the patient can't brush their own teeth, then you will do that for them. If the patient can't get up to shower, then you will help them stay clean. You will become their hands and feet to help patients with things that they can't do themselves. But you are also the eyes and the ears of the healthcare team. You will report everything you see, hear, smell, or feel to the nurse. This is the most important task that you have as a CNA. If you see redness around a wound, you must report it. If you hear the patient wheezing after walking to the toilet, you must report it. If you feel that a patient's skin appears warmer than usual, you must report it. If you notice that a patient is coughing when eating, you must report it. As a CNA, you will be spending much more time with the patient than the nurse does. So you will be in a position to notice a lot more about the patient. The nurse needs this information to make decisions about the patient's care. Reporting these observations gives the nurse another assessment opportunity. That new assessment may even change the tasks you are assigned to perform. This is called the nursing process, and here's how it works. The RN assesses the patient and develops the care plan. This gives you specific tasks to do. While doing those tasks, you notice things. You report those observations to the RN, and the RN performs another assessment to review the changes in the patient. That new assessment prompts changes in the care plan, and this gives the CNA new tasks to do. And the cycle continues around and around as the patient gets better or worse. This is a continuous process until the patient is discharged. I'm not sure I understand. Are you saying the care plan is going to change all the time? Yes, it could, depending on the needs of the patient. Let me give you an example. The care plan told you to make an occupied bed in room 201. As you change the sheets, you notice that the skin on the patient's backside was red and irritated. You notified the nurse, who then reassessed the patient. The nurse decided that the patient needed to be repositioned every two hours around the clock. This was added to the care plan 
as another task for the CNA. Using this model, we can respond to the needs of the patient quickly as their needs change. But it also works for patients that are getting better too. You've been assisting Mr. Hopkins with transferring out of bed and into a chair after surgery. But you notice he isn't leaning on you any longer. You notify the nurse. The nurse reassesses the patient and decides that the patient can transfer on his own now. The care plan is changed and this task is removed from the care plan since the patient is improving. Doesn't this mean that I'm going to be bothering the nurse all the time? Won't they be annoyed? The nurse should never be annoyed with you for reporting changes in the patient. They are legally liable for every aspect of that patient's care. Since the nurse requires that information to plan the patient's care, they expect to receive updates from you on the changes that you see. But how often you will have to report changes to the nurse will depend on the setting you are working in. Nursing home patients are pretty stable and don't really change all that often. That's pretty common for long-term care facilities, like nursing homes and ALFs and even home care. But in other settings, like hospitals, rehabilitation centers, and hospice, patients' health can change rapidly. In those settings, nurses and CNAs are going to work closely, and constant communication is required. Since CNAs must follow the care plan and are not allowed to alter it, they can't solve problems. The RN is ultimately legally responsible for the care of that patient. If you have information about the patient that you're not giving to the nurse, the patient can suffer. And the nurse is legally liable for that. Remember, you are an assistant. You are there to help. But the nurse is always in charge of the patient. So all changes, regardless of how minor they seem to you, must be reported to the RN. When the patient is stable, you will not have much to report and may go days without talking to the RN. But if you notice something, then it must be reported, even if you don't think it matters. If you aren't reporting observations, the nurse can't rely on you anymore. And if the RN can't rely on you, then you aren't a good assistant to that nurse. You must report to the nurse everything you see, hear, smell, or feel. Be a good assistant and report all changes and observations. This is the most important job you have. So the care plan is developed by the RN, gives the team tasks, CNAs follow the care plan, and report changes. Let's recap what we learned today. Can you tell me how a CNA knows what each patient needs? The, the care plan. plan. As a CNA, you follow the care plan, the whole care plan, and nothing but... The, the care, care plan. plan. Anything unusual that you notice about the patient, you must report it to... The, the nurse. nurse. Great job. For the exam, you will receive a care plan. What should you do? Follow it exactly. That's correct. If you don't follow the care plan, you will fail the exam. It's that simple. Now that you understand the care plan, I can show you how the skills will be done for the exam. But remember, you must always read and follow the care plan. That's a big part of the skills exam. Take the brief quiz below to make sure you understand. See you in the next lesson. Okay. Any questions on your role here? Any questions on your role? No? So the role of the CNA is to follow the care plan. All right, Jorge, exam October 26th, three days from now. We're going to send you lots of good vibes. Let us know how you do so we can congratulate you. Sarah says, I'm sorry I haven't been here. I haven't been up to date with things for CNA. I'm going to try to catch up. I passed my CNA exam. Just need to print out the license. Congratulations, Sarah. Great job. Great job. Uh, we'll congratulate you on an upcoming session on Wednesday. So Wednesday afternoon, these are all live people that are attending virtually. And when you uh, when you see those comments pop up, if I don't see them, let me know. Okay. Um, so, oh, <laughs> Maureen's waiting for the CNA test. Good vibes out to you as well. So you're going to see questions pop up on the screen. Um, when you're attending virtually, if you don't come to class, 
uh, and you're attending live virtually, you can actually ask questions as well. They'll pop up on the screen and I give you live answers in real time. So um, we have quite a few on today that are joining us um, virtually. So our role here is to follow the care plan and report our observations. Those are the two things that we're going to do. Now, a lot of people get all tangled up in the skills. Well, what if I get too many washcloths or do I have to do this step before that step? They get caught up in the mechanics of the skills. And we're gonna go over the mechanics because they are important. Um, but I'm always going to put the spin on it from the patients. But how does this affect the patient? Because that's how the test is going to be structured. How does what you do affect the patient? Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that. But remember that when we're in the skills and it's getting a little bit overwhelming, go back to the two parts of your job are to follow the and to notify the right. So observation and reporting. Okay. So following the care plan and observation and reporting, that really is the basis of everything the CNA does. So we're not allowed to think. We can't solve problems, right? So how hard can the test be if you're not allowed to think? Got it? So I'm going to make the written test really easy as we go through this. I also have a um, ebook that I'm going to tell you about in just a little while that will help you with the written test as well. We have lots and lots and lots of resources. I mean, I have got so many resources. And if I give them all to you right now, I'm going to overload you. So I'm going to spoon feed them. So how many of you got the um, email that, you know, yesterday that said, welcome to class? Anybody get that email? Who did not get the email? Who did not get the email? Okay. So um, was your email address right on there? No. Okay. That's why. So we'll change that and we'll make sure that you get that email, that welcome email as well. After class today, um, you will get an email from us that has links to that same video you just watched. So you can rewatch it if you want to. It's going to have um, a lot of, of recap of what we went over in class, but it's also going to give you the link for the ebook as well that I'm going to be telling you about in a little while. So everything that I go over in class, you're going to get in the email. So don't get too worried if you don't get it all like right this second. Okay. A couple housekeeping issues that I go over um, before we really get started. Parking is on either side of the building. So if you parked up front anywhere, we're going to have a break in about an hour. If you could move your vehicles to the side, that would be awesome. That keeps our front spaces um, open for uh, the other people, and especially with such a big class, the other uh, people in the units. Um, I'm not that kind of a teacher, guys. If you need to step outside and take a phone call, step outside and take, but you don't need to raise your hand, you're adults. Um, you don't need my permission to go to the bathroom, just get up and go. The only thing that I do ask is that when you re-enter the room, you try to not make a lot of commotion, um, just so that everybody can hear. Sound good? You can eat and drink in this room. I have no problem with that. The only thing that I ask is that you dump out any liquids before you put the um, uh, cups in the trash for me. And that sink does work. You can dump any of your liquids in that sink. Okay. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Oh, I don't know why I have to go over this with you. Fire Marshal tells me I have to tell you that in the case of emergency, there's your door. It's a big empty room. I don't know why I have to point that out, but there it is. If that one doesn't work for whatever reason, the back door is clearly marked with the exit signs. The back door will let you out. It's locked all the time. It will let you out even though it's locked. But if you want to come back in, you might want to unlock it before you go out. If you go out the back in an emergency, make a right, not a left. A left will run you into a fence, which isn't going to help in an emergency. So out the back to the right. So emergency processes. I don't take attendance. This isn't that kind of class. You're here for information. So I don't take attendance. If you aren't able to come, I would suggest you try to remote in 
Um, that's the, the best way. That way you're not losing anything. You can also catch the replays because we will be sending you the replay link. So at least watch the replays, if nothing else. Um, but I don't take attendance. You don't have to notify me if you're not going to come to class. Uh, but I won't repeat the information because you've got everything that you need to repeat it on your own. Okay. I'm going to talk nonstop for four hours. <laughs> I'm challenged on everything electronic computer. Okay. But Facebook, I can mm -hmm. watch you live. Absolutely. So for your CNA, the number four, Y-O-U-R, CNA, medical training is my Facebook page, and we're live streaming right now. For your C if you just type in for your CNA, it will show up. Okay. Yeah, it's for, for your CNA medical training. I'm pretty sure it's the app for your CNA. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, YouTube, if you know how to get into YouTube. Yeah, <laughs> we're also on YouTube as well. So, um, but yeah, we, you know, we're, we're available in a wide variety of places. Of course, you can, you know, come to class as well. Um, I do have multiple cameras. You can see them here. We've got the big camera there. I've got a camera over the bed. I've got one over the sink, and um, I will be changing up. I have to apologize, though. The one over the sink is not working at the moment. <laughs> it somehow, over the weekend, disconnected itself again. So I've got to get that up and running again. But um, you'll be able to see things from different angles as well. So I have a multi-camera setup, and, of course, I'm, you know, microphones, so you can hear me as well. So we have... You know, everything's set up for production here. All right. So everybody ready to jump in? Let's see if we remember what we learn. We are going to perform the skill as directed on the care plan. We're going to follow the care plan, the whole care plan, and nothing but the care plan. So that's important. I'm going to time out here for just a second. That's important. Because as we go through this program, you're going to come up with questions. Oh, you guys come up with lots of questions. And those questions always start out with two words. What if? Well, what if the patient can't stand? Well, what if the patient doesn't want to eat? What if the patient refuses? What if the water isn't working. What if, what if, what if, what if, what if, and I could go on and on and on. There's a million variations of everything, right? What if my car has a flat tire, right? There's a million variations of everything. The easy answer here is very easy. We follow the care plan. Care plan. Who do we tell if we can't follow the care plan? The there you go. All your what if questions are answered. We follow the care plan. So if we go in to do a skill and the patient refuses, what do we do? Tell the nurse, right? We only have two options here. We either follow the care plan or tell the nurse, right? So what if we are helping somebody with a bedpan and I show you to ask them to lift their hips and they can't lift their hips? What do we do then? We only have two options, guys. We either follow the care plan or tell the nurse. So are you starting to kind of put those pieces together? It really is that easy. The nurse in the care plan is going to give you the information that you need to perform the task. Because in reality, the nurse is the one that should perform the task in a perfect world. Okay? In a perfect world... I would do everything for my patients that needs to be done as the nurse. But I gotta do that whole care plan thing. Do you know how long that takes? Like I gotta go through and find all real problems with the patient, all potential problems with the patient. I gotta write all that down, right? That's a super long process. I've also gotta give medications and treat wounds and review lab results and coordinate with doctors and schedule tests and there's a lot of stuff I have to do. So if I'm brushing somebody's teeth, that's something kind of basic that somebody else could do for me to free up my time to be able to do the other things that need to be done at a higher level, right? So I need somebody that can help by brushing this person's teeth so I can do nursing things. Make sense? Okay. 
but it's got to be a routine test on a stable patient. Like if the patient's got huge, big holes in the top of their, their mouth, and I'm afraid the toothpaste is going to go up into their sinus cavities and, ooh, that would burn. I'm probably not going to ask you to go brush your teeth because that's not really a routine task on a stable patient. Now, if I just got Mary over here and she's just Mary and she's like everybody else and she brushes her teeth like everybody else, she just can't do it today, then that's something I could ask you to do, right? So CNAs perform routine tasks on stable patients according to the care plan because that care plan is going to tell you anything that you need to know about that patient. So in a perfect world, I would be brushing her teeth. But if I'm stuck brushing her teeth, who's going to do the rest of the stuff? That's where CNAs come in. Does that make sense? Got it? That really is our role. So we're going to follow the care plan, the whole care plan, and nothing but the care plan. And if we end up with a what if question, we only have two choices in, in life. We either follow the or we tell the nurse. Guys, you see how easy this test is starting to get? <laughs> okay. Um, while we're following that care plan, we want to take a look and a listen and a smell and a feel for anything abnormal. So we are going to observe for any changes, abnormalities, or pain. And who would we report those changes to? No matter how mundane you think the changes are, you don't get to decide what's important enough to report. Because even small things can have a really big impact on the patient. So here's one that a lot of people don't understand. You're working in a nursing home with an elderly patient who's normally pretty with it. I mean, she's, you know, she's got some serious health problems that she's there for, but mentally she's pretty with it. She knows who you are. She greets you by name every day. She knows where she is. Her husband comes and visits her. I mean, she's with it. And you walk in today and she's just a little bit confused. Like, is it lunchtime yet? No, Mary, you just got up. We're going to breakfast, not lunch. And so that's a change, right? Now, some CNAs might think to themselves, oh, she's getting older. She's just, you know, getting a little flighty, you know. Should we be thinking that to ourselves? Or should we re be reporting that change? Reporting. Yeah, because <clears throat> this gets missed a lot. This might be a, a written test question, actually. But dementia doesn't happen suddenly. Confusion is sudden. They were okay. Now they're a little off, right? That sudden um, indicates a immediate problem. Dementia doesn't work like that. But a lot of CNAs won't, re won't report that because they think to themselves, oh, she's old. She's just confused. Mm. She probably has a urinary tract infection because the very first sign of a urinary tract infection <laughs> in the elderly is confusion. confusion. Yeah. So we would, even though our mind might want to try to justify that, we can't make that determination. If it's a change, it gets reported. Good. So I just answered like half of the questions on the written test for you. If it's a change, it gets reported. We don't get to decide. Now, the written test questions may try to trick you. They may give you some information that will lead you to don't report it. Remember, if it's a change, it gets reported. reported. Now, you're going to hear my voice in your brain on test day. You will. I say the same things over and over and over and <laughs> over again on purpose. Because when you're taking the test, either the skills test or the written test, these little sayings are going to pop up in your brain and it will tell you how to answer the question. But for me, for me, I don't care about the test. I know you do. 
because that test is in your horizon, right? You got to get through the test to get to work, to get certified. I mean, you're thinking about the test. I don't care about that test. You'll pass it. It's okay. I don't care about the test. I care about the day after the test when you go to work. Because someday I'm going to be the body in the bed. And if I don't train you to do the right things, then it might be me who's suffering. Does that make sense? So the things that I give you are designed to help you not just pass the test, but I want these things to pop up in your brain when you're working. I want you to know, okay, wait a minute. I either follow the care plan or I report it to the nurse. There is no other pathway here. Does that make sense? Okay. That'll keep you out of trouble. It will limit your liability as well. The thing about liability, which we're going to get to in just a few minutes, the thing about liability is that CNAs don't have liability as long as they follow the care plan and report all observations. As long as you do those two things, you are covered under the nurse. But the minute, the minute that you start doing something that's not on that care plan, that nurse is not taking responsibility for you doing something that you weren't told to do. Make sense? Okay, we'll talk about liability in a few minutes. So you saw on that video the activities of daily living. So um, I actually have a lesson on this on page 89. You don't have to go there, but this is for future <laughs> reference. Um, this tells you what activities of daily living are, and this is really what CNAs do. The best way to kind of think about activities of daily living is this is stuff you do for yourself every single day without thinking about it. You get out of bed. What's the first thing that most people do when they get out of bed? Okay. Anybody go to the bathroom? Probably, right? It's so a first stop for most people. And then while we're in there, we'll, you know, brush our teeth, wash our face, whatever you're going to do. Um, you probably bathe once in a while. You got yourself dressed. Good job. You probably grab something to eat. And you get yourself to wherever it is you need to go for the day. It might be on the couch to watch you two. Could be to work. Could be to school. But you get yourself where you need to go. You probably engage in some sort of social interaction along the way with somebody, either other people in your house, your family, your roommates, your significant others. Um, it may be with the general public when you're at work or, you know, standing in line at whatever big box store you went to, right? But you engage in some socialization. These things together are called the activities of daily living. It's what we do. Okay, we toilet, we bathe, we groom, we dress, we eat, we uh, get ourselves mobility, get ourselves where we need to go, and we socialize because humans are social creatures. So all of these things together, you will keep doing for yourself as long as you are physically able to. But what if tomorrow morning you woke up and neither one of your hands worked? You're just kind of useless now. Uh-oh, how am I going to go to the bathroom? I'm going to need some help. Certainly not going to be able to bathe myself if my hands aren't working. Not going to be able to dress myself. Probably going to need some help with eating as well. So there's some things there that I'm going to not be able to do for myself that I was able to do for myself yesterday. So you think that might affect my mental status? Do you think that might make me a little frustrated? Because now I've got to rely on you to help me when I was able to do it yesterday. Right? So we have to understand that sometimes when we're helping our patients with ADLs, these are things that you do for yourself. And guys, you get independent of this stuff super quick. Anybody have a two-year-old? Have you ever seen a two-year-old? <laughs> Two-year-olds, they are working on independence. They will do it themselves. Probably wrong, but they're going to do it themselves, right? We start working on independence when we're really, really little, and we don't like to give it up. So when patients are patients, they will do as much for this, themselves as they can. And we're going to let them. 
because that's part of their self identity. We're just going to fill in the gaps where they need the help. Okay. Now, how do we know what gaps to fill in? We follow the care plan. Care plan. Okay. Good. So this was in the video. This is the care planning process. This is the actual graphic from the video. But just to remind you, the RN assesses the patient. Now, when I say the RN assesses the patient, we go in and we do a head to toe assessment. This is a very, RN school, two years, two years, RN school. One year is on the assessment. I am not kidding. One year is on how to do an assessment. That's huge. That's how big this is. This is a really, really, really big thing. So the RN goes in and they look at everything with that patient, every body system, and they look for real problems, but they also have to look for potential problems and they have to write a plan for all of it. And when I say a care plan, a care plan for a patient is generally probably 10 to 12 pages of content. Now you're not going to get all that. You're just going to get the part that's relevant to you, the ADLs. Okay. But this is a really big deal, this assessment thing. So the RN does the assessment and they write up that care plan. In that care plan is going to be specific instructions for the CNAs, things for you to help them with. Remember that CNAs do routine tasks on stable patients according to the care plan. That's our normal. So when you hear me say CNAs do normal, normal means a routine task on a stable patient according to the care plan. Good. While you do those tasks, you're going to make observations, probably without even thinking about it. When you make those observations, you're going to report them to the nurse. The nurse will go in and do another assessment related to that new whatever it is that you found. And that may actually change the care plan. And that may give you new tasks to do or take some tasks away. When you're doing the tasks, you're going to make observations. This whole thing just keeps going round and round and round and round. Now, the problem is that there's a lot of places out there where you've got nurses versus the CNAs. So we got to be careful here because nursing is a team sport. It really is. It takes a team to take care of that patient. If you're on the wrong side of that equation, the patient's the one that's going to suffer. So if you find yourself in a situation where it's you versus the nurse, right? You're clashing, you're bumping heads. Um, that's probably not a good work environment for you because the patient's the one that's going to suffer. I wish I could tell you, oh man, do I wish I could tell you that all the nurses out there were phenomenal. I really wish I could say that. I really do, but they aren't. You have phenomenal nurses out there. Absolutely. But you also have some that seem to have a little bit of a power trip, okay? And they, not everybody is nice. <clears throat> you know, that's probably the hardest lesson I had to learn as an adult is that everybody isn't nice. I assumed everybody was nice when I was growing up, but that's not the case. I wish I could tell you that, but I can't. So if you find yourself in a work position where you're just butting heads with that nurse, you might want to switch to another hallway, another shift, another unit, another place, because your patient isn't going to benefit from that. Okay. Good? Make sense? Remember that nursing is a team sport. If you're on the wrong team, the patient's the one that's going to lose. All right. So let's see if we got what we needed to get out of this lecture. Let's go to page 20. Should look like this. Everybody have a page that looks like this? All right. So this is um, 
this is an activity that we're going to do. I'm going to give you about 10 minutes. I want you to read the care plan, the clipboard looking thing. This, this guy over here, I want you to read that care plan and then answer the questions that are related to that care plan. So I'm going to give you about 10 minutes to get that done. We have a timer. There we go. We have a timer. So I'll give you about 10 minutes to get that done. Um, anybody need a pen? Who needs a pen? So I need one. Okay. And remember that you can uh, write in this book. This is your book. So you can write in this book. So those of you at home who are playing along at home, if you have the book, you can certainly do the activity on page 20. If you don't have the book, you probably want to get it. <laughs> it will help you. So I'll give you about 10 minutes. When you're done with the activity, put your pen down. That way I can see who is still working. Thank you. 
right, looks like we're all done here. Okay, so let's look at number one together. You received the display care plan. How far will you walk this patient? What do you guys think? Ten steps. Ten steps. Ten steps. What can't we do until the patient gets tired? Why wouldn't that be? I mean, shouldn't we be listening to the patient? I don't know. What do you guys think? <clears throat> care plan. That's right. That's right. So if you got a written question that tried to trick you, remember that we follow the care plan. Right? Care plan says at least 10 steps. How far are we walking them? Yeah. You received the display care plan. What is required to assist this patient to stand? We can't just go get a walker and try that? What do you guys think? Okay. What if, what if we go to put the gate belt on and the patient just can't support their own weight with their legs. Tell the nurse. Tell the nurse. Right. I'm starting to put these pieces together. Yeah, the written test can't be very hard, guys, because we can't make decisions. Now, I used to give this quiz when you first walked in. First thing, before I ever showed the video, so when you guys came and sat down, you have the papers in front of you, this would have been on top. So while you're waiting for me to start, you would have done this. And it amazed me how many people failed this quiz because they would, you know, go get a walker. <laughs> they would walk until the patient got tired because they didn't understand. And that, just in the first half hour, I went from... You don't, you know, you're, you're making decisions to no decisions and they got to see that progression. But I got some complaints about that because people didn't like having a quiz when they first walked in and didn't know anything. So I quit doing that, but I liked the, the progression. Just really, you know, it, it's a really defined progression to see. Okay. So um, go to number three. What body part do you want to exercise? Can't we do both if we're there? I mean, exercise is good for you. No. Why? Not in the care plan. Okay, easy answer. It's not in the care plan. Absolutely. So, how many of you guys want the care plans from the state exam? Would that help you guys, do you think? If I could give you the care plans from the state exam, if you knew when you go to test exactly what that care plan was going to say and you could practice that, wouldn't that be helpful? Yeah. Well, here they are. These are the care plans from the state exam. If you get range of motion, this is what your care plan says. Right here. But these are only four. There's only four. There's 20 skills that you have to know how to do. I only gave you four. You want the rest of them? Turn in your books to page 25. These are the testing care plans from the state exam. You will get one of these 11. This is what you're going to be testing on. One of these 11 you will get. And we're going to go through this in detail throughout the whole program. This is just a little taste. I've got a long way to go with you. This is just a little taste. But this um, will give you an idea of how those care plans are going to be presented to you. Each one of these care plans is done according to a very specific formula. There is one ADL skill. Remember, we learned what ADLs are. Activities of daily living, bathing, dressing, grooming, toileting, eating, socializing, that type of thing. You will get one mobility skill. A mobility skill would be like walking or transferring or range of motion or turning a patient over onto their side. You will also get one um, documentation skill. Everybody gets a documentation skill. So documentation skill would be pulse, respirations, feeding a resident, and emptying the drainage bag. 
So you will get one of those four. And you'll see on these care plan sets that one of those four is on every single one of those sets. You will either see pulse or respirations or feeding or drainage bag. So everybody gets a documentation skill. So there's a very specific formula that's used when they come up with these. Okay. So we have to remember to perform the skill as directed on the care plan. We're going to uh, follow the care plan, the whole care plan and right? What are we going to do while we're following that care plan? And who do we report the observations to? The nurse. the nurse. All right. Patricia says, I'm watching from New York. I should be taking the state board exam in January. You are great at your skills, Miss Patty. Well, thank you, Patricia. I, I appreciate that. Uh, we wish you lots of luck and make sure you tune into all eight class sessions you'll probably pick up a few things that will help you on the state exam. And New York uses Prometric, the same exact process as Florida. Same care plan, same everything. So this is very, very relevant to you. All right. So page 25 has all of those care plan sets. Um, so those of you uh, playing along at home, this is the page I just had them go to. Um, and page 22 is going to talk to you about your scope of practice. Now, I've been talking to you about your scope of practice the whole way through. You just didn't realize it. So following the care plan and reporting all observations, that is our scope of practice. It's what we do. But there's actually just a little bit more to this than just that. So if you look over here, where's my thing here? Let me bring you along with me. Okay. If you look over here, this poster, this poster right here is actually your scope of practice. So if you look at this, we follow the, the whole and nothing but, right? So we can say that in our sleep now, right? Um, and we know that CNAs do normal. Now, I've already talked to you about that. That's routine tasks on stable patients according to the care plan. So I'm not going to ask you to go brush the patient's teeth when they got all kinds of holes in their palate and the toothpaste can go up into their sinuses. That is not a delegatable task. That's something I would have to do because it's not a routine task on a stable patient. Right? Make sense? Okay. But the other thing, the other wall here, I haven't talked to you about. Principles guide performance. What does that mean? Well, we're going to do the tasks indicated on the care plan, but there's some specific ways those tasks need to be done. And they're pretty universal. So all washing skills are going to be done the same way. Every time you need supplies, you're going to need a barrier to put them on. Every skill is going to start the same way with the opening. Every skill is going to end the same way with the closing. If your patient's uncovered or undressed, we need a privacy blanket. So these are called principles and they actually are along that back wall. So by next week, you're actually gonna know everything on that back wall without having to go home and memorize it. We're gonna learn it together and it's gonna make sense. Just like we learned, oops, where is it? just like we learned this principle. So out of the 11 on the back wall, we already have one done. We know we're gonna follow the care plan. Care plan, right? The care plan, the whole care plan and nothing but the care plan. Right? So you didn't have to, I, I, you know this now. I just have to say a few words and you fill in the blanks. I'm gonna do that with everything on that back wall as well all of those principles, okay? And those principles are going to be what guides our performance. So those of you at home, you can follow along on page 13. So that is um, part of our scope of practice. So the care plan forms the foundation, CNAs do normal and principles guide performance keeps us firmly where we need to be. It keeps us from straying. Okay. We don't do anything on an unstable patient. 
We don't do uh, unfamiliar tasks. We um, aren't going to do anything other than the way the principals tell us to do it. That keeps us in our scope of practice. Now, above everything, more important than those things even, above everything, is it's all about the patient. Yeah, we're going to follow the care plan. But when we're doing these tasks, we need to be thinking about the patient. It's all about the patient. Because you know what happens as a CNA? This out of the way here. What happens as a CNA, especially if you're out there watching YouTube videos, right? Because YouTube videos are showing you how to do stuff. But that's only half of the story. Knowing how is only half of the story. So if you're spending all your time focusing on what we do and how we do it, right? These two walls, what we do and how we do it. You'll get all caught up in this and you'll forget that this is a human we're doing it on. So this is designed to remind you that this is a human. And above everything else, we need to treat them as a human because it really is all about the patient. Now, some of you, as I go through this program, are going to ask me a very specific question. I told you I've been doing this 15 years. I know what you're going to ask. Do I have to say everything you say? Do I have to talk this out? Do I have to say every step? I mean, you're saying every step. Do I have to memorize what you're saying? And the answer to that is yes and no. You can say it in your own words, but yes, because this is a human and you should not be putting your hands on another human without them knowing exactly what those hands are going to do right so we have to remember that when we get all caught up in these steps that above everything we got to take a step back and remember that it's always about the patient and remember in the video i said the most most important task you have is observation and reporting. Now, mouth care is important. Toileting, important. Feeding, important. But the most important thing is to notify the nurse of everything you observe. Because that is how we catch things early and intervene before they become major issues. Does that make sense? So the most important part of your scope of practice here is it's all about the patient and we report all observations to the RN. So this and what we see up here, it's also on the back of your ID badge. If you look at the back of your ID badge, it's there. That's how important that is. This is your scope of practice. Okay. Questions on that? Questions on scope of practice? If you find yourself outside of this house, if you're doing something that's outside of this house, you are not covered under the nurse's liability. You are on your own. That's a scary place to be. All right. So the video also told you that you're going to be learning additional tasks wherever you go to work. This isn't the end of your education. It's actually just the beginning. I can't show you everything that you might possibly need to learn in your uh, career because I don't know where you're going to end up working. And the tasks that you're going to learn are going to be very specific to where you end up working. So it, by the way, guys, it takes me about four weeks to learn your names and then you're gone. So I will ask you your names a couple of times today um, just to try to, to cement them in my, my mind here. But what's your name? Mary. Mary. Okay, so Mary works in a dementia unit. And she has uh, learned all about how to care for patients with dementia. She's learned about um, distraction and um, how to refocus patients that are in crisis 
and um, how to engage patients in physical activities when they're in emotional overload. She's learned all of that. Now, what's your name? Stacy. Stacy. Now, Stacy works in the mother baby unit. She doesn't know anything about distraction therapy. I'm not working the mother baby. I'm <laughs> wondering. <laughs> So she doesn't need that, that skill. She didn't take an Alzheimer's class because it doesn't have anything to do with what she does on a daily basis. Babies aren't born with Alzheimer's, right? But she is a master at swaddling. She was taught how to swaddle properly and she can roll that baby up like a little burrito and get every baby to stop crying because now they feel warm and secure. So two different skill sets, neither one of which you're going to learn in this class. It's going to be based on where you work. Does that make sense? Now, those are pretty easy skills, right? Alzheimer's training, swaddling, those aren't anything significant. So what about like significant stuff like removing catheters? So you work in a... Um, outpatient surgery center in post-op, which is after surgery, okay? So these people come in, it's a short surgery, they have their surgery done, they recover for a couple hours, eat some crackers and juice, and then we take them out and tell them to go home, right? So you're in post-op. So you're really good at vital signs and, and all that kind of stuff, but you're also gonna be trained to take catheters out because we don't send patients home with catheters. They have them during surgery, but you're going to be trained to take them out. Make sense? Okay. Now you work in pre-op. Now pre-op is where you go to get checked in for surgery and you give patients gowns and socks and make sure they go to the bathroom, get their stuff in patient belonging bags and that kind of stuff. Now, remember that the patient's going to get a catheter at some point. You can be trained to put catheters in. Now, most of the time, we're not going to have you do that because there's a high level of risk there. And who is the one with the liability? The nurse. So because there is a risk there and I'm liable, chances are I'm probably going to keep that skill for myself. Does that make sense? It doesn't mean you can't be trained to do it. You can, but the nurse is going to delegate the tasks that are routine on stable patients that are don't require any judgment and don't have a high level of risk. That's delegation. So no matter where you go to work, you will probably have a few skills that you didn't learn that you're going to have to learn relative to that workplace. Good. So remember, your education does not end here. It just begins. Now, if you're trained to take out catheters because you work in post-op and you go to, you, you leave that job and you go to the hospital and you tell the nurses there, hey, I know how to take catheters out. They're probably going to tell you, well, that's great, but you're not going to do that here. Remember that you're under the nurse. So you're also under the policies and procedures of where you work. So the place that you work is going to dictate what can and cannot be done in that setting. So just because you're trained to do something in one place doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be performing it in another place. Good? Make sense? So... This is, I'm going to figure out how to say this without being, I don't know. A lot of CNAs will get additional certifications thinking it's going to help their career trajectory. And the most common one is phlebotomy. The next one is EKG. The next one is medication assistance. So those are the three most common uh, certifications that CNAs go out and get. Remember, I said that you can only perform a task if the employer allows it and if the nurse delegates it. 
So if you're working in a place where the employer doesn't allow it and you go get phlebotomy certification, it's not going to do you any good because even though you're certified, it doesn't mean that you can perform that task in that place. And I see a lot of CNAs that just, you know, throw their time and money away on a certification that they don't need to work in the place that they're working. And then they don't use it and they can't renew it. So um, be careful, make sure that you're getting the certifications that are relevant to your workplace before you spend the time and money to obtain them, unless you're trying to get a different job and that's what they require. Does that make sense? Okay. Especially because one of our schools locally, <laughs> the phlebotomy is a two year program and you're not gonna make any more money. So you're gonna, you know, sign up for a twenty-five thousand dollar two-year program and not get any benefit out of it. And guys, phlebotomy doesn't need to be two years; it's like six weeks. Yeah. You know. Do I have a question? What What that mean? Oh, phlebotomy is drawing blood. Ah. Oh, okay. Yeah, drawing blood. So just use caution when you're looking. You guys are going to be employable as CNAs. Trust me, I, I right now in my inbox, in my email inbox, I have five employers that are begging to come in here and talk to you on the last day. Five. They want you. You are in demand. You don't need anything else. I'm not going to let them all come in because otherwise we'd have no time. I can't do a job fair in here. Okay. But uh, that's my employer cor corner over there. So you've got some stuff. I'm going to print some other stuff and put it up there um later this week so you've got lots and lots of employment options so you don't need any additional certifications to get started if your employer requires that in the future then certainly add that on but make sure that you're doing it with the right um goal in mind good questions everybody understand delegation okay so this is this comes up a lot uh, and I get this question, oh my gosh, on my YouTube channel, guys, we're, we're now at like 120,000 subscribers uh, on my YouTube channel. I've got over 33 million views. I mean, we're the number one YouTube channel out there uh, for CNA training. And I get questions, I get 100 questions every day. And this question comes up a lot. My nurse asked me to whatever, is that okay? Am I allowed to do that? And the answer to that question is very simply, have you been trained? If you haven't been trained, the answer is no, all day long. No, 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 no. But training does not have to be in a classroom. Training can be at the bedside, one-on-one -on -one with the nurse. That is still training. So my question is, have you been trained? If the answer is yes, then yes, you're allowed to do it. If the answer is no, then don't do it until you get trained. Good? Questions? That is that is the number one thing with delegation. Just make sure you're trained. You will have a written test question on this. You will. Because I want to make sure that you understand your scope of practice. You're going to have a question that asks something like, the nurse asks you to irrigate a wound on a patient's coccyx. Um, you have not received training on how to perform this skill or, you know, what, how would you proceed? A, tell the nurse you haven't been trained. B, delegate it to another CNA. C, uh, watch a YouTube video and do your best. Or D, report the nurse to the board of nursing. Yeah, just let them know. I haven't been trained on that. They may say, oh, you want to learn? Come with me. Let's learn. Good. Remember that the nurse is responsible. So the nurse has to know whether that is delegatable with your employer. They're responsible for that. The nurse has to know if that is delegatable according to your state rules, state statutes. The nurse has to know that the patient is stable enough to delegate that. That's all on the nurse. Your only question is, have I been trained? Easy peasy, right? Okay, 
So we're going to take a quick break here. And because it's about time. Okay, so we're going to take a 15 minute break, uh, come back in 15 minutes, and we are going to get into the state exam. Anybody that needs to go get a drink or something to eat, you are welcome to do so. If you're parked out front, please move to the side of the building. Um, if, you're, if you come back just a few minutes after break, it's not a big deal. Uh, just try to minimize your disruption when you come in. Is the store open now? Yeah. Yes, the store will be open now. Okay. So I work as a caregiver. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I got my med tech license. Mm -hmm. Just got it, and want to get along in this unit. So I have, my question is, I want to go for my LPN license. Mm -hmm. When I get my LPN license, is there a possible way I can grow in the future and become an RN? Absolutely, absolutely. The LPN yeah. is the first year of RN training. Okay. That's so it actually would cut down your RN. Uh, education. All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, there, you should have a link in your email. You didn't get the welcome email? Okay. okay. This would be separate. This this is actually going to come, but I can take a payment here if you uh, if you want to pay. Yes, that would be the invoice. You can. You can just oh. click the pay now button okay. and enter your information and it'll pay it on there. Oh, okay.
And we're back. <clears throat> okay, am I going too fast for anybody? Is anybody lost? No? Everybody okay? Where are we here? Okay, there we are. All right, so in your um, skills book, that's the spiral book. When I say book, I'm always, always, always talking about the spiral book. We'll talk about the other book in a little bit. But I'm always talking about the spiral book. So in your spiral book on page 12, these are all the notes about what I'm going to be talking to you about. <laughs> so you don't have to take notes. But let's talk about the test. Since that is on your horizon, everybody has to take the test to get certified. And you're probably wondering what the test is all about. How is it structured? Well, when it's like come to test day, like, is it going to be like skill written or written? Down? You're going to take both sections, both the skills and the written on the same day. Now, the order is going to depend on the, that day's test. So I'm going to answer your question, but give me about 10 minutes and it'll make more sense to you. Okay. All right. So let's talk about testing day. Um, everybody has to take the state exam at a testing site. Now, there's not a whole lot of testing sites in Florida. Um, <clears throat> yeah, here it is. Okay, so this right here are our testing sites in Florida. That's it. There's not very many. So you can see that every town doesn't have one. They're only in large metropolitan areas. Our closest testing center is in Tampa. We used to have one down in Trinity, but it closed. So they consolidated to the larger uh, city centers. So there are two in Tampa. There's one on the west side, like closer to the airport. There's one on the east side, like over by Bush Gardens area. Okay. Um, the west side's a little bit closer for us. But there's also testing centers in Miami. So if you want to go take the test and get on a cruise ship and celebrate, that's fine. You can do that. You are allowed to test at any testing center in Florida. You don't have to choose the one closest to your geographic location. Uh, those of you who are from our northern counties, there is one in Ocala. Actually, there's two in Ocala now. One north of Ocala, like out by Gainesville or you know, headed toward Gainesville. The other is way east Ocala, like Silver Spring Shores. Um, so we do have some, you know, for those of you who are from Citrus County in Ocala, if you'd rather go that, that direction. When you go to the testing center, you are going to go, um, you're going to be there with seven strangers. You will not be testing with the people in this room because everybody registers independently, you will all get independent test dates. And chances are, you're not going to test with the people in this room. Um, the testing centers test eight people a day, minimum. Some test 16 a day. So it's a, a very well-oiled machine, <laughs> the way the process works. When you go to the testing center, you cannot take any electronics in with you and you cannot take any study material in with you. No flashcards, you can't take your book, you can't take your cell phone. The only things you're allowed to take in with you is your test admission letter if you print it. You don't have to print it, but you can. Your keys and two forms of ID. The two forms of ID is very specific, guys. One of them has to be a state or a government issue, non-expired photo ID. So for most of us, that's a driver's license or a state ID card. But you can also use a passport or a military ID. So that's one form of ID. 
your second form of ID has to have a signature. So a debit or credit card would work. A social security card would work. Um, or any of the ones that I just talked about, a driver's license, state ID, um, military ID, passport. Okay. So one has to be a government issued non-expired photo ID. The second one has to have a signature. Both of the names have to match exactly. So for some of you, this might be a challenge, especially if you have multiple names. So especially hyphenated names, this can get a little bit tricky. So just make sure with your IDs that you currently have, that you have one photo ID and you have a secondary signed ID that has the same name. Okay. If you show up for testing day and those two IDs do not match, you will not be allowed to test. Period. They do not give refunds. So you want to address this early. Okay. When you go into the testing center, oh, what happened here? Where am I? Okay, when you go into the testing center, you're going to go into a waiting room. And when you go into the waiting room, you're going to have um, two rooms somewhere in that center, which is where the test is actually going to be administered. One of them is a clinical skills room. The other one is a computer room for the written test. So if this were a testing center, we were a testing center for several, several years, long time ago. But there would be a wall right here, big wall. This would be the waiting room here. This would be the clinical skills room. So there's a wall and a door. So everybody in the waiting room can't see or hear what's happening in here. It's private. Your clinical test is private. You're not on a stage performing for hundreds. Private. There would be a separate room, like the one next door, for mm -hmm. your computer written test. Okay. So when you're in this waiting room, remember, you can't have your cell phone. So it's boring. You can't have any study material. So you're just kind of sitting there staring at the walls and each other. And it's a little unnerving. Um, try to not make friends on test day. Um, the reason for that is this happens every day. People in the waiting room will sit around and they'll start talking about the skills because you're getting ready to test. And the conversation will go something like this. You would say, well, my teacher told me that we had to use 10 paper towels to dry our hands when we wash our hands. What did you learn? And you're going to say, well, I didn't learn 10 paper towels. I learned to use whatever you need. And then you're going to chime in and go, well, wait, they told me four. And now the whole waiting room is in a huge uproar because nobody knows how many paper towels you need to dry your hands and you're getting ready to go in and test. So what happened to your anxiety level? Right? So don't make friends on testing day. Don't listen to anything anybody has to say. You are going to be trained properly. I will give you all the answers you need. But if you listen to the people in that room, they will derail you. So be careful. After you're certified, go train the world. Before you're certified, don't try to correct anybody in that, that waiting room. Because you're the last person they talk to. If they fail, do you know who they're going to blame? You. So be careful there. Just kind of keep to yourself. When you come in, the two evaluators are going to check you in. They're going to make sure that you are you and you're not testing for your cousin or your sister or your mom or whoever. They want to make sure that you are you. Once they check everybody in, they're also going to ask you, do you have any conditions that would keep you from being a patient for any of the skills? We'll get into that a little bit later, but they're going to ask you that question. Keep it in mind. If you just had oral surgery done and you've got stitches in your mouth, please let them know because... Um, that can affect how the test is going to be administered, okay? So they're going to go away. They check you in. They find out if you have any conditions. And then the two evaluators go away. And they're going to be gone for like 20 minutes. And you're going to be sitting there going, oh, my gosh, let's get this test started. There's nothing to do. Remember, you don't have your phone. 
You know, I'm going to study material and I told you not to make friends. So you're sitting there for 20 minutes with nothing to do. And it's very unnerving. Now, they're doing something very important in that time frame. And I'm going to get to what it is in just a minute. But they're doing something very important in that time frame. And it's going to take them a little bit of time. When they get back, they're going to divide you up into groups of two. And this is not random. And I'll explain why in a minute. But they're going to divide you up into groups of two. Now, in here, I am going to make it pretty random. <laughs> okay, you guys are group one. Don't go anywhere. Okay? You're going to be testing first. You guys are group two. You've got about 30 to 45 minutes to kill. So you can go out to your car and study. You can go grab a cup of coffee. You can take a nap. Uh, but don't go far because you're going to have to come back. You need to be back in the waiting room in 30 to 45 minutes. You guys are group three. You've got about an hour and a half to kill. Go target shopping, clearance shopping, you know, clear your head. You guys are group four. You've got about two to two and a half hours to kill before you're going to be testing. So two for one margaritas at Chili's. We'll see you later. All right. You guys would be brought into the testing center because you're group one. So when they bring you into the testing center, remember wall door, nobody out here can see. So they bring you guys in and they show you around because you've never been there before. You don't know where the washcloths are. You don't know where the basins are. You don't know what they're using for a privacy curtain. So they have to give you an orientation. So they would literally take you in here and they would show you for those people at home that want to play along. They would show you, this is our patient bed. This is how you put the head of the bed up. This is how you put the head of the bed down. This is our, this is our dirty linen hamper. This is where your dirty linens go. This is our privacy curtain. We close it for privacy. Notice it does not go all the way around the bed. One in a clinical setting goes all the way around the bed. It provides privacy. The one in the testing center won't because they need to see what you're doing in there. They're grading your performance. So this is just to show that we would be providing privacy, but it's not going to completely encompass the bed. This is the patient bathroom over here. You've got a sink and a toilet. Um, this is the three drawer bedside cabinet, and this is where all of your supplies are going to be. So they're going to show you around. They're also going to show you. Come over here. They're also going to show you. This is the patient's call light. Now, some of them will look like this, like a call light. Anybody ever see any of my skills videos online? Any, okay. My skills videos online, the, the older ones. Uh, we used a jump rope and some of the testing centers will use a jump rope. So it still has a little bell on it, you know, a little end on it. that looks like a, a bell. So they'll show you what they're using as a call light. So good. They show you around. And you can ask questions. You can ask all the where questions. Oops, wrong way. You can ask all the where questions you want to ask. Where would I find washcloths? Where would I find whatever? You can also ask how questions as it relates to the equipment. How do I engage the brakes on the wheelchair? How do I put the head of the bed up? Those questions are fine. What you can ask is, so how do I do hand and nail care again? You can't ask procedure questions. Good. Once they go through the whole orientation with everybody, then... They're going to pick one of the two of you. Remember, you guys are group one. They're going to pick one of you to go first. So give me a number one to 11, please. Nine. Okay. So the um, computer randomly picked skill set nine. Okay. Understand the evaluators do not pick your skill sets. The computer does. Now we're going to have you go first. You have skill set nine. Now, the evaluator can't even trust that you know how to read. So the evaluator is going to read this to you. So your skills are measure and record pulse, and they would read the care plan. Perform passive range of motion to shoulder, and they would read the care plan. And provide perineal care to an incontinent patient, and they would read the care plan. Then, once they've done that, 
they're going to hand that to you. That is yours throughout the entire test. So when you're in the middle of a skill and you can't remember what the care plan said, you can go back and read it. Because remember, our entire job is to follow the care plan. They don't expect you to memorize it. So it's there for you. Put it in a visible location. You can go back and look even in the middle of the skill. No problem. But you have three skills to do. You need a patient, don't you? Hmm. You're sitting around with nothing to do. So you're going to become the patient for him to do those three skills on. Except one of his skills is peri care. Mm -hmm. Now, this is personal care below the belt. <laughs> you're not going to volunteer for that, I'm sure. So for some skills, some, we're going to substitute a mannequin for the more personal skills. Okay, good. Now, you're going to do those three skills in the order listed. So you're going to do pulse first, then range of motion, then peri care. When you're all done with your test, you would then become the patient for her to do her three skills on. She would get a different care plan set. It would be read to you, handed to you, and then you would start your test. When both of you are done with your skills portion, you'll go back out to the waiting room. You don't know if you've passed or not. You go back out to the waiting room. Group two, you're brought in. Same process. You test, you're going to test on him, he's going to test on you, you go back out to the waiting room. Group three, you get brought in, you're going to go, you're going to test on her, she'll test on you, go back out to the waiting room, group four, stumbles in from Chili's, you test on her, she tests on you, you go back out to the waiting room. When everybody is done with the skills, then you would go into the computer lab for the written exam. 60 questions, multiple choice. Okay. Good. Now, that's how it goes most of the time. But if you fail one section of the test, so let's say, let's say that uh, you pass the skills but fail the written because there's a language barrier and, you know, it makes it harder, right? You would have to retest, but you only have to retest the written. Whatever you pass stays as a passing score. So even though you have to retest, you're not taking the entire test again. Make sense? Okay. So what your question was, was do they do the skill, you know, skills written? It depends on who's there to test that day. If it's all first time testers, they'll do the skills first and then the written because at the end of the written, you get your printout and you leave, okay? Because it's gonna tell you both uh, scores for written and skills. But if I have three people there that day that are retesting written, they'll do that part first to get those three people tested and out so that all that's left are the skills people. So the evaluators have some latitude there, depending on how the, you know, who is there to test. Good. Now, remember I said that when you get checked in, the evaluators go away for like 20 minutes. They're actually pairing you up during that time because it's not random. If you get transfer from bed to wheelchair, they need to put you with somebody about your body size or smaller. If you get, uh, let's say that you just had some dental work done and you got some stitches, well, you can't be a patient for mouth care or denture care. If you've got a sprained ankle, we can't have you as a patient for ambulating, transfer, or range of motion, hip, knee, and ankle. If you have athlete's foot, we can't use you for uh, foot care. Do you see how your conditions would affect how they put you in groups? Okay, good. Questions? Questions on any of that? Okay, 
So I forgot to take you through the slides. So let's go through this really quickly here. So uh, all eight people show up. They're going to pair you up into groups of two. I get so busy talking, I forget about my on-screen graphics. They're going to pair you up into groups of two. Remember, this is not random. There is a method to this. Once you're paired up, you're going to go into the testing center and they're going to show you around. They're going to give you your testing care plan set, read it to you, hand it to you, and then the other person becomes your patient during that um, skills performance. These are the, the actual testing care plan sets. This is, this is it. This is what you're going to get. Mine are a little bit uh, prettier, <laughs> but theirs are printed on yellow paper. I just pretty mine up a little bit. And down here, you've got the amount of time that you would have to perform that skill set. These are in your book. We've already seen these on page 20, I think it was 24, 20, 25, sorry. You've already seen these. But I have them in here for you to practice with as well. Okay, that's what you see here. On the back, these are the checklists that you're being graded on. So when you're in here practicing, you can pick the care plan set you're going to perform, and on the back are the steps. So have somebody check you off. Remember that each one of these care plan sets has one ADL skill, one mobility skill, and one documentation skill. There is a pattern to it. So these are the ADL skills here. So an ADL skill would be a mouth care, denture care, hand and nail care, foot care, partial bed, bath, carry care, catheter care, bedpan, make an occupied bed, and dress a resident with a weak arm. Those are the skills that fall under ADL. You will get one of these. These are the mobility skills, range of motion, all three, transfer, ambulate, and change position. These are mobility skills. You will get one of these. Documentation skills, pulse, drainage bag, feeding, and respirations. You will get a, res a uh, documentation skill. So you're going to get one out of this column, one out of this column, one out of this column. But they're made up into very, very specialized pre-planned sets that we have here. No. <laughs> that we have here. Okay. So this is how the test is um, set up for you. Nothing random here. The test is very, very scientific. Very scientific. Now, on the back of this are all the steps, and this includes indirect care, which we're going to talk about in just a little bit. But just remember that these steps include indirect care later, that you have access to that. So when you're doing the skills... Remember I said there's two evaluators in Florida. Most of the time we have two, not always. Like everywhere else, the testing centers are short staffed <laughs> sometimes. So sometimes you may only have one RN evaluator, but they try to give us two. Now that's actually for your benefit because if one nurse sees you do a step and the other nurse doesn't, it doesn't count against you. So it's actually to your benefit to have two sets of eyes, okay? But when you're performing the skills, they are going to have this checklist in front of them, and this is what they're going to use to check you off. This is the same thing that is on here, okay? Same thing, except that this <clears throat> includes indirect skills that isn't listed on here. So if you go on to Prometric's website, this is available for everybody. Everybody. You can print this off. You have access to the exact checklist they're going to be grading on. This is available to you. But remember, it doesn't include indirect care. That does. And that's going to be important later. So when you do a step, so let's say uh, one of your skills was pulse, right? Let's go to pulse. This is false here. When you do a step, you get a check mark. It's that simple. Do the step, get a check mark. If you don't do a step, no check mark. If you do a step but do it wrong, 
<laughs> no check mark. So everything that you did correctly gets a check mark, just like this. Anything without a check mark is called a deficiency. Deficiencies are what count against you. At the end of the test, the evaluator is going to take this checklist to the computer and they're going to put into the computer all of the deficiencies, everything that doesn't have a check mark. The computer is the one that decides whether you pass or fail based on what you missed. Okay, the evaluators do not fail you. They do not fail you. The computer does. Let's get more in here. Our AC is either cold or hot. There is no in between, so bear with me. All right, so. So I have a whole lesson on this on page 65 of your book that you can read if you want to, but it explains how they're going to use your deficiencies to either pass you or fail you. And I have a video on this as well. When you're looking at any page in the book, if you see this, this little video clapboard thing, that tells you I have a video on this. These videos are found in my website under animated lessons. So I have a whole video on this that will help you understand. You're also going to take a written test, 90 questions, multiple choice. You have an hour, I'm sorry, 60 questions. You have 90 <laughs> minutes to do it. Um, let me explain to you the weighted uh, aspect of this, though. I told you that you, you are going to get checked off, right? So each step has a check mark. The reason the computer has to decide whether you pass or fail so the next question you would want to ask is, well, how many can I miss and still pass? And that's a very common question. And the answer is it's not that easy. So let me give you an illustration to help explain this. Let's take that lady over there. If we have to um, brush her teeth, right? We're assigned to brush her teeth. Is she in a safe position? Why? Okay, what can happen? Yeah, we don't want to kill our patient. That probably won't look good on the test, right? <laughs> so what would we need to do to get her into a safe position to brush her teeth? Her yeah, you can put the head of the bed up. You can get her to sit up, get her on the side of the bed. I don't care how you do it. The care plan may indicate how to do it. But we got to get her sitting up in some way, right? That's just common sense, isn't it? Well, if you forget to put the head of the bed up, that's pretty important. It's going to weigh a lot. If it's not on the care plan. What's that? If it's not on the care plan. Well, this is a principle. So principles aren't going to be on the care plan. Okay. So that's why we have to learn how. This tells us what to do. That's going to tell us how to do it. So putting the head of the bed up isn't going to be on the care plan. But we have to know that that's a required step. No, in real life, yes. But when, when you are taking the test, you also need to do it? Yes, we're going to put the head of the bed up, but we need to, it's not going to be on the care plan. We need to know that's a step. Okay. So putting the head of the bed up, pretty important. Now, when you guys brush your teeth at home, where are you standing when you brush your teeth usually? Okay, but we're not like standing up like this brushing, are we? We do this. Why do we lean forward a little bit? Yeah, right, because we don't want toothpaste on our clothes. We want to be able to spit into the sink. So putting the head of the bed up gets them into this position, but when we brush our teeth, we're usually in this position. A little different, isn't it? Well, it's okay. This is still a safe position. We're, we're still good, but the problem is that when they spit, it's probably going to get on their clothes. Now, we can put a towel on their chest to prevent their clothes from getting all messed up. And that would be a really good idea, right? So a, a step for the test would be to put the head of the bed up, get them in a safe position. And a step for the test would be to put a towel on the chest. Now, those are not graded equally. 
Because if you forget to put the head of the bed up, you kill your patient. If you forget to put a towel over a chest, we have toothpaste on clothes. Yeah, they're, they're not equal. Does that make sense? So every step for the test is weighted. Things that impact the patient are going to be weighted heavier. Things that, nah, nobody's going to die from it. They're weighted a little lighter. So I can't give you an answer how many steps can you miss and still pass because it depends how heavy were the steps that you missed. Some skills missing one step will fail you, like head of the bed. That would fail you. Make sense? Good? All right. Oops. So, let's go back here. Um, so that's how we grade the uh, written test now, or the skills test. Now, the written test is a little bit different. The written test is also weighted, but in a little bit different way. There are a few questions on the written test called critical concept questions. Now, normally, when you take a written test, now, everybody's taken a written test at some point in your life, right? Math test, spelling test, English test. You've all been through school, so you've taken written tests. You know how this works, right? They give you a question. They give you some answers. You pick the right one. And that works here, too. The problem is with this is that there are a few questions, usually between two and four questions on the exam, on the entire exam, where it's not enough just to pick the right answer. You have to avoid a critical wrong answer. So if you, uh, I'll give you an example, okay? This would be, we want to avoid a question or an answer that would put our patient in immediate physical jeopardy. So here's a, a question. You walk into a patient's room and you see smoke coming from a trash can. What is your first action? A, remove the patient from the room. B, contain the fire, close the door. C, activate your emergency response, call the fire alarm. Or D, extinguish the fire quickly. So, R-A-C-E. R-A-C-E, that's yeah. right. Yeah, anybody who's worked in medical knows this. Um, R-A-C-E, this is actually the way we're supposed to do this. We remove, alarm, contain, and extinguish. If you pick remove the resident, you're right. Good job. Keep going. You're on a good path. If you picked contain the fire or pull the fire alarm, it's not the right answer. You're going to get it marked off because the question asks, which would you do first? Okay. So you're going to get marked off, but it's not going to really impact you other than uh, you miss one. But if you picked D, if you picked extinguish the fire immediately, it would fail the entire exam. And that's because that one answer put your patient in immediate jeopardy. You got a patient in the room when you're trying to put a fire out. And if that fire gets away from you, we have a patient in immediate jeopardy. Do you guys understand how that would be a problem? Okay. So there are two to four questions on the written exam where it's not just enough to pass the question, you have to avoid the answer that puts your patient in immediate jeopardy. Now, I have a book that explains all of this. It's a CNA test coaching. This is free. It is a PDF download. You're going to get in your email today, you're going to get a link to be able to download this for free. Okay? All right, but this will help you. 
Uh, this is a workbook style, so it, it leads you through how to answer each question. Um, the students that have used this, we've had uh, over, over a thousand downloads of this and overwhelmingly um, people have said that this has helped them pass the written exam. Overwhelmingly. So it's worth your time. All right, so when you take the test, you're going to get some test results. They are. So when you take your test, you're going to get some test results. This is what they look like. It's what you see here. This is a test result for the written. Down here, you'll see how many um, questions are in each category and how many you got right. At the top it tells you whether you passed or not. You will also get a result sheet for the skills. Same thing at the top, it tells you whether you pass the skills or not. At the bottom, it lists your skills, the skills you got, that's gonna spill over into the next page. Oh, I don't have that page. And then you're gonna have a page with deficiencies. Your deficiencies is everything that did not get a check mark when you perform the skills. So this is everything the computer used to determine whether you pass the skills or not. If you don't get this page, that means you got a perfect score on the state exam. Most of my students do not get this page. When I'm done with you, now remember this is day one. I still have seven more to go. And notice how I'm talking nonstop. I do that seven more times. <laughs> By the time I'm done with you, you will have all the knowledge you need to pass the state exam without any deficiencies easily. Because just like I explained that we follow the, what do we follow? The whole and nothing but, okay? Just like that, you're going to be able to understand every other principle along the way. Okay? But you will get um, your test results at the end of testing day. If both of them say, congratulations, you passed, you're a CNA. You just wait for your blue card to come in the mail. Usually about five to seven days. Florida is super quick. Um, they'll mail you your blue card in five to seven days. But you can actually look your number up online within 24 hours. And the papers they give you, these papers, they are your temporary certification. So you can take these papers to any employer to prove that you pass. And they can look you up. Okay. So any questions on that so far? Any questions? Does this certification, like, if you move to another state, it still works or you have to take the test again? It depends on the state. And we're actually going to go into that in detail on the very last class. Oh, okay. But uh, if you, those of you who really um, have a burning desire, I have a lesson mm -hmm. in the book. I cover <laughs> everything for you guys. <laughs> you. Yeah, you are amazing. Um, page 172 and 173. Tells you what to do if you're moving out of state. What about moving into Florida? Um, again, if you're certified in New York and you decide to move to Florida because everybody moves to Florida, no, you don't know why. Um, you would contact the Board of Nursing in Florida, say, I am a New York CNA, I want to be a Florida CNA, and they'll tell you the process. Some states, they're like, cool, give us a little money, do our background check here, and we'll give you a certification. No problem. Other states are not, not so easy. There is no universal CNA certification because CNAs, um, the statutes are different for most states. There is nothing streamlined or consistent with CNA training across every state. They're just now, just now working on that for nursing, for RNs. 
And right now, I think they only have 31 or 32 states that you can work in, in multiple states with a single license. It's not even nationwide yet. And I don't, I don't know that they'll ever get there for CNAs. I just don't, I, I don't know if they will. All right, so. This course is designed specifically to make learning easy. I want you to pass the test. We need you out there. We have a whole bunch of patients that aren't getting good care because we're short staffed. We're about a million CNAs short. I need you to pass the test, and I'm going to do everything in my power to make that happen. In order to make that happen, I have simplified complex principles to make them easy to understand and easy to duplicate. But it goes beyond the test. What I'm teaching you, I'm teaching you because it is the right way to do things. So when you get out there, when you get certified and you start working, you're going to hear people say things like, yeah, that's what you learn in school. That's not how we're going to do it here. Remember that above everything, it's always about the patient. Everything that I'm going to teach you keeps that in mind. If you deviate from everything that I teach you when you get out there and start working, Remember that you are putting the patient at risk and you are no longer in your scope of practice. Does that make sense? You are now liable. So everything that I'm going to teach you, it, it's going to be very easy to learn. But remember that I made it easy so that you will keep doing it even after the test. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so what I did, like I said, I've been teaching this for 15 years. When I first started teaching, man, I was all over the place. My first class did not do well on the state exam. Did not do well. On, out of 12 people, I had one that passed. That was it. I quickly said, oh, apparently being a nurse is not enough. <laughs> I probably need to learn this test if my students aren't doing well. That was 15 years ago. I made this my life mission. I know more about the CNA test than pretty much anybody else because I made it a mission, okay? So what does that mean for you? Well, that means that I have such a deep understanding in what they need from you that I was able to put all of that information together and streamline it and simplify it. Now, the problem for you is you're going to sit over there and say, it can't be this easy. It can't be this easy. It is if you follow the path that I've, I've created. Okay? So be careful here. Don't overcomplicate this. Because when you start throwing things in here, if you start going to other channels and watching skills and listening to friends or family that work in healthcare, it can take you off track because they didn't study the test. Okay, so just be careful. Um, the number one thing that that the number one illustration of this is that how many of you guys have family in, that work in healthcare? Okay. All right. If you go home and you ask your family, how do you take a pulse? You will get two answers. The first answer that you'll get is, oh, we use that little clothespin thing. We use one of these. You just put it on the end of the, the finger, you press a button, it gives you a reading. And they're right, it does. There it is. My pulse rate is 84. We can write that down. That is a pulse rate, it is accurate. You can use that, but you can't use it on the test. The second answer that they will give you is, oh, you just count for 15 seconds, you multiply that by four, and that's your pulse rate. 
right? Everybody that works in healthcare will tell you, you just count for 15 seconds, you multiply that by four, that gives you your pulse rate. That does not work on the test. Because if you go to page, well, let me take you to the actual page. Go to page 53. And let me explain to you why. At the top page 53, you're going to see the care plan. This is the testing care plan. The actual care plan you will get if you get this skill on the state exam. And if you read the care plan at the top page 53, it's going to tell you, patient will be lying in bed for this skill. Take the patient's radial pulse measured at the wrist for one full minute and record your readings. What do we know about the care plan? Follow it. This care plan tells us to count for how long? And your family told you to count for 15 seconds and multiply by four. You have failed the test because you did not follow the care plan. It doesn't mean that that was not a valid way to take a pulse. It is. Multiply by four is a valid way to take a pulse, but not for the test. Because the test needs you to follow the and the care plan says to count for one full minute. How many of you guys remember playing Simon Says when you were a kid in school? That is what this is all about. Instead of Simon, it's the care plan. If you do what the care plan says, when the care plan says to do it, you will pass. If you do something the care plan doesn't tell you to do, you will not Good? Questions? So be careful about the resources you go to because well-meaning people will pick, take you right off track and you'll end up failing. So be careful. So what I did in this huge research project, guys, this was a master's level research project. In this huge research project that I did, I looked at every single um, skill that you're going to be tested on. I looked at every step in each skill that you're going to be tested on. And I realized, Hey, wait a minute. Step number one is exactly the same in every single skill, all 20 skills. Step number one, exactly the same. Huh? That might be important. And then I went on and looked and I said, Oh, but wait, Step number two, exactly the same in every single skill. So I wonder if I can use that somehow to make this easier for students to learn. Instead of learning 20 skills, maybe I could just teach them how to do the same steps that are repeated over and over and over again. And we can create sequences to make learning easier. And that's exactly what I did. That's what you're going to learn on this back wall. These are repeated sequences that apply to multiple skills, but they're always done the same way. It's the same checkpoint in multiple skills. Good. Always done the same way. I also noticed at the end of every skill, the last the last um, checkpoints were the same. There were a few small additions in a few of them, but for the most part, they were pretty much the same. And I thought to myself, you know, I might be able to work with this. So it took me a long time to create this whole process. Now it's so simple. It's being used by schools and organizations and the largest hospital group in America is using my whole system, my online course, my book, my lectures, all of it, because it works and it's easy. And by the way, they do this training in a week and a half. You guys have got four weeks to get it down. So what I did is I took those sequences, those checkpoints and I created something called the opening. 
And this is how we're going to start every single skill because it's going to check off a checkpoint on every single skill. So the opening is going to be, and we're going to get into this in detail in just a few minutes, but we're going to start with a knock. We're going to greet our resident. We're going to address them by name and introduce ourselves by name and title. We're going to describe the skill and get permission. We'll close our curtain, we'll wash our hands, and we'll get our supplies. But if you notice this, this is our key point here. Do not touch resident until hands are clean. This is a critical checkpoint. If you go in and touch that patient before your hands are clean, it doesn't matter what else you do in the skill, chances are you're gonna fail. Good. We're going to talk about why in just a little bit. So along the way, this is actually pretty new. I just created these about three months ago. This is the actual checklist for oh, skills is feeding a resident who's sitting in a chair. This is the checklist. This is what they're going to check you off on. See how um, the opening is green, right? So every single green dot you see there is a step that that opening satisfied. These are available up here for you guys to play with. If you start looking through here, you'll start connecting the dots and you'll start to see how all of this is satisfied by most of that. And it'll, it'll help you kind of put it all together. But let me go back here. You notice that most of that is red and green? Notice that most of those are red and green? That's your opening and your closing. Like out of all 19 steps there, half of your checkpoints are your opening and closing. Mm -hmm. Very little has to do with actually feeding. It's how you treat the resident. Remember, it's always about the patient. Yeah. All right. So let's keep going here. We've already done that. Okay. So these are what we call the big four. These apply to every skill. We're always going to follow the, uh, the care plan. We're always going to do the opening. We're always going to evaluate glove use, and we're always going to do the closing. doesn't matter what our, our um, skill is. And we're going to learn these today. We're not glove rules that that's a whole day glove rules is a whole day but we're gonna get to that on wednesday but we're gonna learn we've learned skill rules we're gonna learn the opening and we're gonna learn the closing today these four apply to every single skill that we do i can't teach you skills until you learn these because they apply to every single skill that we learn All right, so you have all of these on page 27 in your book. So everything on that back wall that we're gonna learn, you actually have in your book. We're gonna go over with each lecture. You're gonna hear this over and over and over again. You don't have to go there, but if you need it, it's there in your book. And we've already talked about our, our um, scope of practice. <laughs> Sometimes I get a little out of order. Page 21 though, let's get there. So at the bottom of all of this, guys, is the fact that we are learning. When I say book, I'm always talking about the spiral book, not the yellow book. Um, at the, the base of all this, it always has to be about the patient. But let's spend a minute or two talking about the patient. Um, how many of you guys have ever been a patient in a hospital? Anybody? Most of you. Okay. All right, I'm going to challenge a few things. <laughs> I, I'm going to, we'll get there. All right. So here's the thing about patients. You have to be sick enough to earn that bed. Like 
I need a vacation, guys. You have no idea. I am so overworked. I need a vacation. I am running ragged. But I can't call up my local hospital and say, yeah, I'd like to reserve a room for three days, and I just need some R&R. &R. I need somebody to take care of me. They're going to say, no, that's not what we do. Go book a hotel or a spa. That's not, that's not us right? You can't make a reservation at a hospital. You have to prove that you're sick enough to be there. So most of us go to the ER. That's how we get into the hospital. The ER's job is to not let you in. Anybody ever go to the ER and they tell you, here's some prescriptions, go home, right? It's very hard to get a bed in a hospital when you go through the ER, their job is to not give you that bed to get you well enough to get you out. So that means that the people in that hospital are sick, sick, sick. They are the sickest people in our community. Does that make sense? This isn't garden variety sick. This is sick enough to earn that bed. Now, they are there by themselves. They are there with other people who were sick enough to not be home. Now, because they're ill or injured, their immune system is currently occupied, working very hard, trying to get them better. But they're in a place with other pathogens that were bad enough to make that person sick enough to be here. These are big germs. This is a scary place for your patients. Does that make sense? Because their immune system is already occupied and they're in close proximity to other pathogens. That is a dangerous dangerous place because if this patient gets infected with another pathogen their immune system is not going to be able to fight it now this isn't some far off scenario sci-fi never happens type thing this happens to one out of every 25 people in the hospital one out of every 25 people gets infected with something they did not come in with. Now they're not out roaming the halls, playing gin rummy with other patients. How did they get that secondary infection? That's right. It is spread by staff members. So this is a big deal, guys. We need to understand infection control inside and out because our patients are at risk. And this isn't just limited to the hospital. It also applies to rehabs and nursing homes and assisted living facilities. These patients are sick enough to not be in their home. That automatically puts them at risk because when you're sick, where's the one place you want to be? More than anywhere else, you want to be home. And if they're not home, they're at risk. Does that make sense? Good? Good? All right. Yeah, when I'm sick, I want to be home. I want to be on my couch. I want to be watching the Hallmark Channel with my chicken noodle soup. Right? What's our mood like when we're sick? Oh, yeah, grumpy. Yeah, give me what I want and go away, <laughs> right? We want to be waited on, but we don't want you there, right? We're grumpy, super grumpy when we're sick. Now, the one thing that you need when you're sick is rest. It's what makes us better. It gives our body time to fight off whatever it is that it's fighting. You need rest. Now, most of you guys put your hands up when I asked who had ever been in the hospital. How much rest did you get while you were in the hospital? <laughs> right? So one thing we need, and we're in a, the one place that you'll never get it, because on average, 17 people come in and out of the hospital room every 24 hours. 17 people. Uh, they don't just come in from 9 to 5, do they? 
Uh, they come in at 2 a.m., 4 a.m., 4.30, 4.45, right? So you just, just about drift off to sleep, and then there's another stranger standing over you with a sharp object in their hand. Your patients are probably not getting a lot of rest. So what do you think that does to their mood? Anybody ever get sleep deprived? What does that do to your mood? Oh my gosh, yeah, so we've already got grumpy. Now let's add a dose of irritable in there. Yeah, now I'm not home, which is the one place I'd rather be, so that automatically makes me a little on edge, right? And because I'm not home, I'm probably thinking about the things at home that require my attention, like who's feeding my cat? Who's gonna make dinner for my family? What's my significant other doing while I'm in here? I might also be thinking about my job. How is this, whatever's going on with me, going to affect my job? And I'm probably thinking a little bit about the bill that I'm going to get at the end of this fun activity, right? So I'm probably a little bit distracted. Does that make sense? So I'm grumpy, I'm irritable, probably a little frustrated and distracted. Guys, this is not a recipe for us to be best friends. So when we go into assist our patients and we find that they're grumpy and irritable and distracted and a little self-focused, we need to understand that that's exactly where they're supposed to be. So we need to adjust our communication to meet their needs, not expect them to accommodate us, right? So probably the most memorable CNA encounter I've ever had, and I've been a nurse for a very long time, I had a CNA come up to me and say, well, she started it. <laughs> really? Okay, well, you're going to go outside on break, and I'll be out to talk to you shortly, because I'll never yell at you in public. <laughs> but we're going to have a conversation. And I'm going to go in and talk to the patient and smooth things over, because that patient has a right to be grumpy and irritable and frustrated. They're having the worst day of their life. And for you to expect sunshine and roses out of them is unrealistic. If you've got a nice patient, that's a great day. Right? Thank whatever your higher power is for a great day. But that's not what we should expect from our patients. Our patients are going to be withdrawn, non-communicative, internally focused. That is their job. But we need to set our expectations accordingly. Does that make sense? Sick patients have a right to access. Good? Good. I find it helps if you set expectations early. All right. Patients are going to be different. Every patient is going to be different. No two diabetics are exactly alike. No two gallbladder surgeries are exactly alike. I have three children. I love them all dearly. And none of them are exactly alike. People come in all different arrangements, right? The way that we treat one is going to be different than the way that we treat another because their conditions are going to be different their reaction to those conditions are going to be different. Their um, metabolism of medications is going to be different. Their uh, development of secondary infections is going to be different. Everybody is different. So we've got, that's what the care plan is all about. It is individualizing that care for that specific patient. And that is what forms the basis of everything that we do. But we need to remember that patients are all going to be different. So when you catch yourself thinking, well, that's normal for Alzheimer's patients, or that's normal for the elderly, or that's normal for this and that, be very, very careful because you're making a broad generalization that may not apply to this patient. 
So just be aware that our patients are all going to be different. And those differences count. So when it comes to the test, we spent a lot of time talking about the test today. When it comes to the test, a uh, question I get asked a lot is, well, when I'm taking the test, what if I make a mistake? What if I realize I've made a mistake? And the answer is you're allowed to make corrections for the test. They know that you're brand new. They're looking at how you're treating the patient. They're looking at, are you following the care plan? They're looking at infection control processes. So we're not giving our patients another illness to work with. They're looking at, do you understand the principles that are going to keep our patients safe? Okay. So they know you're new. It's not showing that you're perfect. It's not showing that you're a master CNA. They expect you to be all over the place. That's okay. It doesn't have to be pretty. But if you make a mistake, you need to recognize that you made the mistake and correct it. So this is just as simple as correction. I would have closed the curtain before I started the skill. And now you get that check mark that you didn't get earlier when you didn't close the curtain. Remember, the paper doesn't know whether you did it or corrected it. You get a check mark. Okay? So you're allowed to make corrections. All right. So let me teach you, or let me go over how we're going to get through this course. So in front of you today, you had this syllabus, this book, and this book. This syllabus tells us how we're going to get through each one of these books. So when you're looking at the syllabus, the columns each column is a category. Each row is a day. So up here, class one Monday, that's where we are today. You'll see the first column is in class skills and it tells you what we're going to do in class that day. So, so far we have learned skill rules. I haven't made it very far. <laughs> The second column are reading assignments. This is These are lectures that I give in the class. So what to expect on the CNA exam? Oh, we did that. Delegation and liability. Oh, we covered that as well. Patient considerations. We talked about patients. Testing care plans. Yep, those yellow things. Um, and then the principles. Let's puzzle this out. I explained to you how we're grouping sequences together to make them easy to learn and duplicate. So we've already done all of that. If we go over here to the homework column. We're going to skip right over that for a minute. We'll come back there to the very end additional activities. So five key phrases. That's our scope of practice on the wall. We've talked about that already. We did the care plan activity on page 20. We talked about corrections. And I'm going to end skills grading. We're going to go over warm, dark, and moist in a few minutes. But if you look at this last column and you see, hey, wait, we didn't get to that page, you need to read it because there's information in there that you're going to need. Okay. And then we get, let's go back to that homework column. This is the dreaded homework. Nobody likes it. I get it. I don't like it either. But the fact of the matter is there's information that you need that I'm not going to be going over in class. And that's where the yellow book comes in. This is your homework reading book. We do not work out of this book in class. In fact, take it home, leave it there. Don't need to bring it back and forth to class. It's only for homework. So if you look, you'll be reading chapter one in the yellow book. Just doing the reading isn't enough though. You need to quiz yourself. Did you get what you needed to get out of that book? So you're going to take the test on page 181 in the spiral book. So you're going to do your reading in the yellow, take the test in the white in the spiral book. Good? Questions? Okay. Thank you, Caitlin. So in the homework column, you'll see each day is a different lesson in your reading. So on Mondays, we always have one chapter because there's not much time between Monday and Wednesday. But from Wednesday 
till Monday, there's more days, so you get two chapters. So this weekend, you'll have chapter two and three. And budget your time, guys. Two and three are long. They're long chapters. Read for 10, 15 minutes. Go do something else. Come back, read for 10 to 15 minutes. Go do something else. If you just try to sit there and read all of chapter two, your brain, your eyes will keep scanning the page, but your brain's gone. It's, it's thinking about something totally different. You're not absorbing it. So you need to give your brain time to digest what it just read and catalog it before you try to shove more in. Okay? Good? But chapter one, you should be able to get through pretty quick pretty easily. Any questions on homework? Any questions on what we're going to do in class each class period? So if for some reason you're not going to be here on Wednesday, whatever reason, you can remote in. That's fine. But if you don't remote in, you would want to make sure that you do these lessons. You can see the page next to it. So glove removal, page 43, mouth care, dressing, pulse. You want to make sure you do those lessons you're going to, uh, again, the reading activities and then your additional activities. This is all what we're going to go over in class on Wednesday. A lot of information, guys. If you miss one class, I don't do busy work. I don't do busy work. So if you miss a class here, you've missed a significant amount of information. Think about how much I've already given you today. Okay. Good. So if at all possible, if you can't attend live, make sure you at least watch the replay. That's why I do this for you, so that you're able to get caught up. Now, the really cool thing is, how many of you guys um, know how to work YouTube? Okay. With YouTube, you've got that little gear at the bottom. You can speed me up. <laughs> I, sound like, I sound like Minnie Mouse, but you can speed me up and get through it a little quicker. All right. So just to go over it, the yellow book is going to be um, used just for homework reading. Take it home, leave it there. You don't need to bring it back and forth to class. At the top of your yellow book, there is a Y and a number. When I call your name, can you please give me the Y and the number? Stacy. 13. Cassandra. Y9. Natasha. Five. Jenna. Twelve. Dwight. Two. Dalton. Eight. Regina. Fifteen. Cheryl. <clears throat> Brittany. Eleven. Nicholas. Four. Angela. One. Felicia. Three. Marie. Fourteen. Catherine. Six. Alina? Ten. Thank you. All right. That's how I keep track of who has what book. <laughs> you will be returning that book to me on the last class. So you'll bring it back the very last day and turn it in. So please don't write in it. Don't highlight it. Don't make notes. Um, I will be collecting that book back. If you have some need to purchase it, um, go to, you know, the big store online that everybody goes to and you can order it there. Um, I'll sell it to you, but I'm going to sell it to you for way more than they will. So unless you want to, you know, donate to my cause, <laughs> go online and order it. All right. So you're going to read chapter one in the yellow book, and then you're going to take the test on page 181 in the white book. But once you take that test, I actually want you to grade it. So the very last page in your white book is your grading, your answer key and grading scale. So you're going to take the test on page 182, 181 and come here and grade it. If you miss something, go back and look it up. I don't care about grades. I couldn't care less about grades. I'm the only teacher in history that says I don't care about grades. The reason I don't care about grades is because if I'm the body in the bed, I'm not going to look up at you and say, what's your name? Right? I'm not going to look up and say, Dwight, what'd you get on chapter four? I don't care what Dwight got on chapter four. I am hoping that Dwight knows enough about what he learned in chapter four to recognize the signs of a heart attack when I'm having it. Right? 
So for me, it's all about comprehension, not grades. So if you grade your test and you realize you missed something, go back and look it up and retake the test to make sure that you get the information. My goal is when I come in on Wednesday and I go down my list and I ask everybody how they did on their test and you give me your scores, my goal is that everybody tells me they got 100. That way I know that you identified your mistakes, you remediated, and you regained the information that you needed. Good? Questions? This is your answer key down here. It tells you if you missed one, you got a 95. If you missed two, you got a 93, you got an 85. <clears throat> Questions? So to pass, uh, what is the, the threshold? Great. For my, for, for my tests? No, for the real situation. For the, the state exam, there is no published number. Yeah, they do not publish it for Prometric. They don't tell you whether it's 70 or 75. They don't tell you. Because remember, some of those questions are critical concept questions where just missing one question can fail the whole test. Because of the answer put your patient in jeopardy. Okay. My goal is to give you enough information you don't do that. Because I'm going to be the body in the bed one day, guys. I am absolutely going to be the body in the bed. We all are. We all are. Absolutely. That is the one constant in life. Yep. All right. So let me show you how to use the spiral book. So if you go to page 52, we're just going to go through this really quickly. You'll get the hang of it as we start to go through the skills, as we start to learn the skills on Wednesday. But just a really quick overview of how to use this. So this is the first page that you see when we're going to get into a skill. It tells you the specific steps that are being graded. This comes directly from that checklist. Remember that checklist we talked about? So these steps come specifically from that checklist, but so do these. So we are going to follow the care plan. We're going to do our opening, which we're going to learn in a minute. We're going to evaluate if we need gloves. This is these steps here and we're gonna do our closing. This is what makes up all of the checkpoints that you're being graded on. So if you look through each one of these steps, this is a step that you're being graded on. I've just made it easier. It's way easier to learn five steps than it is to learn 28. Agree? So I'm simplifying it, but once you've seen it done a couple of times, you don't need all of that, you know, all of this stuff, right? You just want the, the, the short form. Give me the cliff notes when I'm practicing. That's what this is. These are your cliff notes. This shows you I have a video on this. You can go watch my video. And down here, this is test specific information. The test says that somebody with your level of experience should be able to do this skill within five minutes. Do you remember the care plan for this one? It told us to count pulse for one full minute. They're giving us five minutes to do that, guys. Five minutes. Well, maybe you have to sneeze. <laughs> they give you way more time than you need, so don't rush. Tells us who we're going to do this skill on. In this, this case, it's going to be on another testing student. Hold on a minute. Nope, I don't want to be on break. Okay. I got to get through this. Okay. So um, it tells you that it's going to be on another testing student, but there are some skills where we're going to be doing this on a mannequin. So you would see a mannequin here. If you see a mannequin, it means for that skill, we'll be doing it on a mannequin. For instance, dressing a resident with a weak arm is going to be done on a mannequin. Tells you where that person or mannequin is going to be at the beginning of the skill. So in this case, chair, sometimes it's bed. Look there to see what, you know, where the patient is. And that way, when you're practicing, you can set your practice up just like the state exam and use it as a dry run. 
and it'll tell you whether charting is required as well. So if you look at the next page, in this case, it's 53, you'll see the care plan. We've already read this care plan. We've been to this page before. It tells us to count the pulse for one full minute. Remember that we're graded on following the care plan. This is the number one thing that people miss on pulse. They don't count for one full minute. Here, step-by-step -step instructions. Anybody have a live person at home? Live person? Anybody live person? Yeah, try not to use dead ones. They don't help you real well with this. But if you hand your book to a live person at home, just find one laying around, hand the book to them and say, read each step to me. They read the step and you do it. They read the step, you do it. They read the step, you do it. You will perform the skill absolutely perfectly. When you were in school, did an instructor ever tell you, go home and practice and you had no idea what you were doing? You didn't know if you were practicing right. You didn't, I mean, there's nobody there to grade you. I mean, it, practice isn't practice if you don't know you're doing it right. That's why I have this. If you follow this, you are doing it right. But once you've done it once or twice, you don't need your live human to read this to you. Now you want to do the skill and have your live human grade it. Just tell you what you missed. Okay. So you can actually create a testing environment at home long before you get to the test. Good. At the bottom, you'll see a supply list and I actually have pictures of each supply to make it easy for you. So you know what they look like. This one's pretty easy, clock and you know, paper, but some of them are a little bit more complex with medical items. So the pictures there will help you. Um, these step-by-step -step instructions are going to correspond to each one of those checkpoints. And I always have comprehension questions on there. So once you've seen the, the skill, you should be able to answer those questions very easily. The answers are in the back of the book. Um, but this is a great way for you to identify your learning deficiencies if you don't know the answer to that question. Now this one, let's go back here. This is a documentation skill, measure, record, pulse. And remember, we will all get a documentation skill, right? There's four. Pulse, respiration, drainage, bag, and feeding, you will get one of those four. Um, so keep that in mind. The documentation skills, you want to make sure that you know inside and out because you will get one of those four. So I have an online course for you. You are going to get an invitation to this online course when you get home today. You're going to be enrolled in the course. You don't have to use it, but you should. This course breaks everything. Now, I'm detailed, guys. I am super detailed. But you're only getting like maybe 20% of how detailed I can be. This course is going to bump that up quite a bit. So this course takes everything that I say and makes it interactive. It makes it interactive. So you're not just sitting there listening. You're actually involved in the learning. So this is worth your time and you're getting it for free as part of this. I sell this course alone for $149, but you guys all have access to it by being in this class. This is a game changer. If you're serious about passing the test the first time, this is going to be your best friend. And it Do doesn't take long. Of that? No, because it's interactive. Yeah, it's interactive. I can help you get in, get enrolled in it. Um, but this is, you'll get an invitation. This is the website for it. And it's also on that piece of paper that you had um, in front of you today. How long is it available for? What's that? How long is it available for? A year. Oh, so we can oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, you got all the time in the world. Is it cold in here? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I can help you. <clears throat> All right, so let's go to page 30 and learn the opening. Uh, 
Oh, I need a seventh inning stretch here. All right. So the opening is going to be a part of every single skill we do. So we need to learn it and learn it well, because we're going to be doing it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And if you remember that the opening and closing together is going to make up about half of your score for every skill. That's how important this is. So with all the principles that we're going to learn, everything on the back wall, I have a page set up like this. I show you the principle, the full principle. I show you what skills that principle is going to be a part of. And we have a video on it as well. Now, I'm not going to make you watch the video, but it is in the course and it's on my website. You have lots of opportunities to be able to get into that video if you want to. But I'm going to explain all of this to you in detail right now. All right. So notes are on page 31. Again, you don't have to um, take notes in here. But there are very specific steps, and the order of this matters bigly. It matters bigly. All right. Our steps are every skill starts with an opening. Every opening starts with a knock. Now, the reason for that is remember those patients needed rest? Remember we talked about that? Patients need sleep and rest. Well, imagine for a second, you are trying desperately to get some rest and you're in a very public place. You are in a room, the door is open, there's people in the hallway. You're not in a secure location, but you finally manage to drift off. And as you're laying there, drifting off, you hear a noise and your eyes pop open, and there's a random stranger dressed in pajamas standing over you with a sharp object. Now, how well do you think you're going to be able to rest after that, knowing that that can happen at any time? Probably not. Because patients need a secure environment, knocking becomes a pivotal act to enhance the security of our patient's environment. Does that make sense? If you don't knock before you go in, you're basically telling your patient, I don't care about you. You're something that I do stuff on, not a person I'm here to help with. That's a way different impression. Does that make sense? So every skill starts with an opening, but every opening starts with a knock. This is a critical concept. It is important. Good. Okay. Now for the test, we don't have to wait for a come in. You may get one. But remember that the person you're doing this on is another testing student. They have a script they have to follow. When you're a patient, you get a script. But they may or may not say come in. And that's okay. We don't need to come in. But we are going to knock. Now, in a clinical setting, if the door is open, I don't need to come in. I can just knock and enter. Open door policy. But I'm still going to knock. Even though the door is open, I'm still going to knock. But if the door is closed... I want you to take just a second, just a second, and think about all the things you do behind closed doors. All the things you do behind closed doors. Now, your patients may be engaged in any one of those things. Okay? So when the patient's door is closed and you knock, you probably ought to wait for a come in because there are some things in life you cannot unsee. Okay? Wait for a come in. Now, if I knock and I don't hear anything, and I don't hear anything, I'm going to crack that door open a little bit and I'm going to announce myself. 
Hey, it's Miss Patty the nurse. Everything okay in here? If I still don't hear anything, I'm coming in. Because chances are there's something going on in that room that's keeping my patient from being able to answer me. Okay. So we knock, we wait, we knock again louder, and then we announce, and then we go in. So they got lots of opportunities to get themselves together if they don't want to be seen. Okay, good. But knocking is pivotal. Don't forget the knock. Once you go into the room, you're going to identify your patient by name. For the test, there is no ID band. No ID band. And that's because patients, for the most part, are able to self-identify. Think about yourself at a doctor's office, right? When you go into a doctor's office, they don't give you an ID band. They put you in a room. There's other people in other rooms. When they come in with your chart, they come into your room to see you, and they say, now you're Dalton, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So everybody, this is Dalton. Say hi, Dalton. Hi, Dalton. Hi, Dalton. Hi, Dalton. Okay. So I know his name is Dalton. But when I come in and say, hi, Nicholas, how are you today? All right, how are you? Yeah. <laughs> really? You want what I got in store for Nicholas? <laughs> no. Nah, probably not. No. no. So if I walked in and said, hi, Nicholas, and your name is Dalton, you're probably going to let me know, uh, not Nicholas, right? You're able to self-identify. Good? Make sense? But do they need proof? Nope. Don't need proof. So patients are able to self-identify unless the nurse with that assessment has figured out that the patient cannot self-identify and then they would put something in the right care or care plan yeah that would tell us how to identify that patient so the system's already there good for the test all of our patients can self-identify so all we're going to do is walk in and identify them by name now for the test they only use one name they think it's super easy everybody is mr or mrs smith Mr. or Mrs. Smith. Super easy. Okay. So, hi, Mrs. Smith. How are you? I'm good. Okay. Good? Good. So, you don't have to learn a whole bunch of complicated names. For the test, they make it easy. Now, I want to talk about that real quick. When it comes to healthcare, I, I don't know what happened to our society about 40 years ago. I have no idea. Something weird happened to our society about 40 years ago. And we became very informal. Um, most of you are too young to understand that, that statement, but we became very informal. <laughs> it used to be when you greeted somebody, you did not use their first name until you were invited to. And the only people that got invited to were people that were personally known to you. So I don't know what happened. I don't know why that changed, but in healthcare, it shouldn't. There needs to be a level of professional separation here. I should not be calling my patients Henry and Martha. I should be calling them Mr. Hopkins and Miss Bickford because I need that level of professionalism. Now, I don't know why this changed and you're not gonna get penalized for calling patients by their first name. But when you do, it changes the dynamic. I don't call patients by their first name. I may, if they tell me, if they insist, oh, call me Henry, please. I will then call him Mr. Henry. Because it changes the way they see me if I'm informal with them. Does that make sense? If you want to raise the level of your professionalism, don't call patients by their first name. Does that make sense? You will never hear me call somebody Mary or Martha or Henry. I will call them by Mr. Last Name or Mr. Henry if they insist. Good? Make sense? Now, I am a Southern girl, and I'm sure that plays a part in this. But... 
do a little experiment. Once you get certified and get out there working, do a little experiment. Call some of your patients by their first name. Call others by their last name. And you will see that they relate to you differently. It's weird. But it does raise the professionalism. Good? It's like, I don't understand why teachers do this in high school. You should never call your teacher by their first name in high school. They are not your friend. And I know that teachers are trying to get friendly. There needs to be a separation there. Boundaries are important. Okay. All right. So we're going to knock. We're also going and we're going to greet our resident and address them by name. Now, greeting them is just saying hello, hi, good morning, whatever. Remember, these are humans. We want to treat them that way. Um, we are going to introduce ourselves, but not just by name. We need to let them know our name and title. So, hi, Mrs. Jones. I'm Patty, your CNA today. I'm sorry. Uh, so, for the test, they will either use Smith or Jones. Some places have, have changed, but they're going to give you a name to use. Just go by whatever name they want. So, knock, knock, knock. Hi, Miss Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. You don't just want to walk in and say, hey, I'm Patty. Okay. Patty who? Patty the person that brings the cookies? I like that, Patty. Patty the person that brings the needle? Not so much. <laughs> right? They need to know your title to be able to understand the role you're about to play in their life. So, hi, Mrs. Jones. My name is Patty, and I'll be your CNA today. So make sure you tell them both your name and your title. That helps them with expectations. Okay. Once, you, um, once you've introduced yourself, you're going to tell them what you're there to do. Now, for the test, you're going to be nervous. I know you're going to be nervous. I know you will. But remember, you got one of these guys, right? They gave it to you. It is in your possession. So if you're nervous, you can actually pick that up and say, Hi, Ms. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today, and I'm here to measure and record pulse. Is that okay? You can read it right off the care plan if you want to, if you're unsure of what to say. Or you can just put it in regular words. I'm here to take your vital signs. Is that okay? Good. Questions? You want to make sure you get permission. Anybody know what it's called when you touch somebody without their permission? Anybody know what the legal term for that is? Touching somebody without their permission? Battery. Battery. Touching somebody without their permission is called battery. So if I, if you're at the movie theater and I come up and I start taking your shoe off to do foot care in the movie theater and you did not want foot care done in the movie theater, and you're, I'm touching you in a very personal, weird way, in a very, you're uncomfortable. You're probably going to call the cops to let them know that this really weird person is taking off your shoe and touching your foot, and you don't want that to happen, and they're going to charge me with battery. Now, all of you can agree, that's a ludicrous situation, right? Nobody would do that. And yet, change the setting, Make it a nursing home, not a movie theater. And all of a sudden, we think that's okay. The roof has nothing to do with it. The building has nothing to do with it. You touch somebody without their permission, it is battery. I don't care where you are, who the person is, or what medical condition they have. Touching somebody without their consent is battery. And yes, people in healthcare can and are charged with battery for touching people without their consent. Patients have the right to refuse any skill at any time for any reason, and you have to comply. But if we can't follow the care plan, what's our only other option? Well, the nurse. There you go. It's the nurse's job to solve that problem, not ours. 
CNAs get themselves into trouble all the time for holding patients down and performing skills on them that the patient is uncomfortable having performed. And if you don't believe me, go to a board of nursing meeting. I'm there. I listen to them. <laughs> Happens all the time. You don't have the right to touch another human. I don't care what the setting is. If you can't do the skill, let the nurse know. Got it? But by asking permission, we're showing that we understand that concept. So our opening sounds like this. Hi, Ms. Jones. Good morning. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. I always like to ask my patients, how are you? If I'm getting ready to do a skill on them, I like to know how they are before I start. Because if they say, oh, I, I'm awful, I'm nauseous, I got a headache, I'm dizzy, I just feel poor. It doesn't matter what I got planned, we're not doing it. And that just saved me a whole bunch of time. Okay, so I like to ask, how are you today? So, good morning, Ms. Jones. How are you? My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today, and I'm here to take your pulse. Is that okay? So that's our opening, okay? We're gonna greet the resident, we're gonna address them by name. We're going to introduce ourselves by name and title, describe our skill and get permission. Now, once we've got all of those, and it has to be done in that order, okay? Order counts here. You don't wanna just walk in and say, okay, I'm here to take your pulse. Oh, I'm Patty, is that okay? Well, is it okay that you're Patty? I don't know. <laughs> you know, you, the order matters there. Okay. So, um, oh, it's dead. Okay. All right. I'll do this manually. Okay. So, my opening sounds like this. Hi, Ms. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. I'm sorry. Good morning, Ms. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today, and I'm here to get your pulse. Is that okay? Fantastic. I'm going to close your curtain and go wash my hands. Now, this is a privacy curtain. Who touches this in a clinical setting? Everybody. 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 Patients in bed scratch what itches. And then they touch the curtain. Visitors pick their nose in the elevator. And then they touch the curtain. Healthcare workers put gloves on, empty the drainage bags, and then they touch the curtain. This curtain is not clean. It has every pathogen known to man on it. Now it is taken down by housekeeping and laundered about once a year. I'm not kidding. In between, it's sprayed with disinfectant spray. But this is not a clean item. So what do you think we should do after we touch the curtain? Sure. Yeah, those two things should be tied in your brain now forever. When you touch that curtain, you need to wash your hands. It is not clean ever. So we're going to go wash our hands. After we've washed our hands, we can get our supplies. Now, the order there is important. You cannot get your supplies before you wash your hands. Supplies are clean. We need clean hands to get clean supplies. Good? Good? So, one more time. Good morning, Ms. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? Fantastic. I need to get your pulse. Is that okay? I'm going to close the curtain, go wash my hands, and get my supplies. Now, the best place for you to practice this is in your bathroom at home. You have a door to knock on. You got a person to talk to, the one in the mirror. You've got a curtain that you can close, a shower curtain. And you have a sink right there to wash your hands. So everything that you need to practice the opening is in your bathroom at home. Now, since send your family out for ice cream because you'll sound weird. 
<laughs> but you should practice this. Because remember, every skill we're going to learn starts with this exact process. Knock, knock, knock. Good morning, Mrs. Jones. How are you today? My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. I'm here to, insert name of skill here, is that okay? Close curtain, wash hands. On Wednesday, we're going to start learning skills. If you don't practice the opening and you have no idea how to do the opening, when we get into practicing skills, you're going to be stuck here, not where you need to be. So start learning the opening and get it down. Okay. Good. Just on the wash the hands and gather supplies. After that, you wash your hands again, right? No. Once you've washed your hands and gathered your supplies, you don't have to wash your hands again. Okay. Because you've only touched clean supplies. So you're not touching anything in the bed basin. You're not getting out things to help them maybe brush their teeth. Yes. The yes. But everything that's put away should be clean when it's put away. And the drawer is always when we're putting things away at the end. What, and you'll see this um, with basin cleaning later on in the program. Mm -hmm. We open the drawer with a paper towel to okay. store items. Because other than that, I'm thinking as I'm gathering everything. I'm touching handles, I'm touching doors, I'm touching the cabinet to get the linens. Right. Well, so I would think my hands are dirty at that point. I'd want to wash again. And then for the, and that's fine. You're allowed to wash again mm -hmm. if you want to. There's no problem with that. Mm -hmm. For the test, the um, uh, linen mm -hmm. area is open. So you're not touching doors. The drawers that you may be touching to get your mm -hmm. patient items out of, right. those are, again, only touched at the end of skill with paper towels. Okay. So they should, it should still be. Mm -hmm. clean. So one of the things, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more when we get into basin cleaning, mm -hmm. but we're looking for clean, not sterile. You're right. So um, it really depends on the setting I'm in. If I'm in a yeah. patient's home, then yeah, I'm probably going to wash my hands again mm -hmm. right before I touch the patient. Right. In a clinical setting, everybody should be playing by the same rule book mm -hmm. <laughs> and everything, and the drawer should still be clean. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So let me show you in the course how we make this interactive. Okay, so I have a video on this. You can watch the video. I didn't show it in class, but you can watch the video that leads you through this. Most of my um, instructional videos like this are done in the animated format so that you can read as well as watch. Um, but then below that, we actually have an activity, which we're going to do together here, this activity, to see if we can put these steps in the right order. So let's see if we know how to do this. So you don't have this in your book. This is in the online course. So you would see these eight steps, and it asks you to put them in the right order. So out of these eight steps, what's the first thing we need to do with every skill? How do we know what to do? So there's a hint. How do we know what to do with each patient? So step one would be read the care plan. So let's make that step one. So you actually drag that into the first position, interactive. So once we've read the care plan and we know what we're going to do, we know we have to do the opening, and every opening starts with a no. knock. knock. So that'll be our second step. So we're going to drag that, drag that into the second position. What would we do after we knock? Okay. So we're going to identify the patient by name. Then what Then what do we do? Okay, tell them our name and title. Now what do we want to do? Okay, explain and get permission. Then what do we want to do? Close curtain, yeah. Yeah, and then? Wash hands. Yep, and then gather supplies would be last. So let's check this to see if we got it right, okay? Yep, we did. And you can do this as many times as you want to. It resets each time, okay? So we've made these steps interactive and put you into the learning. Now, every lesson in the online course has some interactivity to it to help you 
put into practice what we've learned. Okay, good. All right. Okay, so the closing. Now this again is gonna be done for every single skill. This is on page 34. And I do have a video on this that you can watch if you want to, but we're gonna walk through it. So there's lots of steps to the closing, a lot of steps. Lots of steps to the closing. It gets overwhelming. But the good news is, for the most part, the order of this doesn't matter. For the most part. There are a couple steps where the order does. We're going to get to that in a minute. But the way to kind of remember this in an easier format is it's the eight C's of the closing. You can see that here in the middle. So the first thing we want to do is make sure the patient's in a clean and safe environment. So patients rest better when their area isn't cluttered, when everything is nice and neat. So take a minute to look around. Is the patient environment nice and neat? I usually will straighten the sheets or make sure the overbed table is cleaned off or whatever I need to do in the environment to make sure it's nice and neat. If there's a food tray in there, we can take it out of the room. Make sure the patient's in a clean, safe environment. Part of safe is the bed has to be in the lowest position. Now we'll talk about that a little bit later on in the program, but the bed needs to be in the lowest position. That's part of clean and safe. Patient needs to be in the middle of the bed. Again, that goes along with safe. So clean and safe, okay? Um, we wanna make sure the patient's comfortable. And for the test, they need to hear that word. You actually have to say, are you comfortable? They need to hear the word. But comfort is more than just physical. Comfort is also emotional. And people are social creatures. We need to have some sort of entertainment or distraction or something to focus on. We don't like to be bored. So we can offer a magazine or we can offer to turn on the TV or something like that. You want to address emotional comfort as well. So for the test, we're just going to keep it simple and offer a magazine, right? It's just kind of a placeholder showing that we understand physical and emotional comfort is important. So are you comfortable? Would you like a magazine? Good. Good. Okay. Patient needs to be covered somehow. Clothing, sheet, something. We don't want a patient just in a gown hanging out in bed. That is very vulnerable for our patient. So they need to be covered. So we need to take a second just to make sure that the sheet's arranged properly or that they're dressed before we leave. We want to make sure that we open that curtain. Again, patients are social creatures. If the curtain is closed, it isolates the patient. Patients that are isolated tend to not recover as quickly. Isn't that weird? But isolation affects recovery. So you want to make sure that curtain is open unless the patient has specifically requested that it's closed or the care plan tells us otherwise. Um, you want to give them the call light. They have to have a way of contacting you. Now, those six steps or five steps, the order doesn't matter. Nobody cares how you do them. Open the curtain, give them their call light, ask if they're comfortable, make sure they're covered. Look and see if the area is clean and safe. Doesn't matter how you do it. I don't care. For me, I think comfort curtain call light clean. That's just how my brain processes it. Comfort curtain call light clean. Um, but you can create your own however you want to do it. The order doesn't matter. But once you're done with all of those steps, patient in that bed has cooties. And they are there with all kinds of cooties. And you've touched all of those cooties. So before you leave the room, what do you think you need to do with those cooties? Wash them off. Yeah, you got to get rid of them. Absolutely. So we're going to go over to the sink and we're going to wash our hands. Now, once you've washed your hands, you don't want to go back to the cooties. You're done. So if you forgot to give the call light, you go over and wash your hands. And you come back over and give them a call light. You just cootied right back up. What do you think you need to do? Yeah, you've got to think about cross-contamination here. So we do all of our steps of the closing and go 
clean our hands. It's another C. Once we've cleaned our hands, then we're going to chart if necessary. Remember, everybody gets a charting skill. Everybody gets a documentation skill, right? So we're going to chart. Once we've charted, we have to wash our hands again. So we have to wash our hands first because this pen goes in our pocket and goes home with us at the end of the day. You don't want to touch this with cootied up hands. But once we've documented, whether it's a paper documentation form or in the computer, we're probably contaminated. So we have to clean again. Good. So comfort curtain call light clean. Clean your hands. Chart. Clean your hands again. Questions? So your closing sounds something like this. Thank you very much, Ms. Jones. Is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? Your environment's clean. You're covered. In the middle of the bed, bed's in low position. Are you comfortable? Can I get you a magazine before I go? Here's your call light. Let me open your curtain. Clean my hands. Chart if necessary. Clean my hands again. Long. Lots of steps there. But that's why the opening and the closing makes up about half of your score. A lot of steps that have to be covered for the test. Good. Questions? No way out of this one. You just got to learn it. You're going to hear it. You're going to hear me do the, the closing about probably 30 more times. Uh, really? So you you just need to learn it. Okay. But the order doesn't matter except when you get to clean your hands. Okay. That has to be done last. After everything else for the patient is done. Clean your hands, chart, clean again. Good. Am I going too fast? No. Okay. So this is just a bigger um, version of what you have on your um, paper there. The eight C's of the closing. Clean and safe, comfort, covered, curtain, call light, clean your hands, chart, clean your hands again. All right, I have an interactive activity for this, but we don't do this one in here um, because it's, uh, well, this is the video, but the um, interactivity just shows an image here and you have to click on each area. So I can't really do that in here because this, this isn't interactive. These are all just screenshots of the interactivity. So... You would want to make sure that the bed is in the low position, the patient has their call light, you've offered a magazine or some sort of reading material, you've opened the curtain, you've asked if they're comfortable, um, you've made sure their environment is clean. Once all of that is done, you've washed your hands, documented and washed your hands again. A lot of steps. A lot of steps. All right. So now we're going to move on to a skill. Hand washing is a skill. It's actually graded separately on the state exam. Yes, it's part of the opening and part of the closing, but they're actually going to grade hand washing as a skill. So for the test, you're actually going to get graded on five skills. The three that are on the care plan. One, two, three. Three that are on the care plan. Hand washing is number four. The fifth skill you're graded on is called indirect care. And we're going to go over that in just a minute. Okay. So hand washing is graded separately. On page 44, it tells you exactly the steps that you need to comply with to wash your hands properly. Remember that hand washing is part of the opening and part of the closing, but it's always done the same way. Right here, this is our checklist for the state exam. Now, the thing about hand washing is they're not going to tell you, what's your name? Jenna. Jenna? They're not going to say, Jenna, go wash your hands. They don't do that. You have to know when to wash your hands. It's graded. So nobody's going to tell you, go wash your hands. 
you have to know during your opening when you would wash your hands and then go do it. You have to know during the closing when she, you should wash your hands and then go do it. That's when they're going to grade it. Evaluator number one will grade your hand washing during the opening. Evaluator number two will grade your hand washing during the closing. After your first skill, they're probably going to tell you you can simulate hand washing. Simulate means say. They've watched you do it twice. They don't need to see it again and again and again. So you would just say when you would wash your hands. So for skill two and three, they will let you simulate. Do not simulate unless they tell you to. Because if you made a mistake, they may watch you wash your hands during skill two and count that one instead. So do not simulate until you're told to. Okay? Good? Again, up here, this is your short version, your Cliff Notes version. So do they actually look the way you're going to wash, like the doctors, they always wash on, on the back of... I'm going to show you how to wash hands. Oh, ah, okay. I'm going to show you in detail. Yep. Ooh. Yep, they're watching you wash your hands. So step-by-step -step instructions are located on page 45. Shows you exactly how to wash your hands step-by-step. -step. And normally I do this at the sink with the top down, but my camera's not working. So I am going to show you the video for this because it has good close-ups. And it explain, and it's me. It's, it's the same view you would get here. It's just on tape. Um, it, so it, it'll take you through it. Um, When you're looking at this step by step, when you're watching the video, look at the step by step instructions to make sure that you understand how the video is showing, what the words are telling. And then you can um, fill this out, answer these four questions. If you can answer these four questions after watching the uh, demonstration, then that means that you've got it. But you do need to practice this. Okay. So I want to go over the important steps before I show you this, this skill. So when we're washing our hands, we're going to turn the faucet on with our hands. It's, it's fine. Faucets are dirty. Your hands are dirty. There's no problem there. You can turn the water on. doesn't matter whether you use cold water, hot water, warm water. Nobody cares. Make it comfortable for you. A lot of people think they have to use hot water to wash their hands, to get rid of the germs. Mm -hmm. um, the water would have to be boiling. You can't wash your hands with boiling water, guys. You'll never get it hot enough to kill the germs. Just make it comfortable for you. Okay, turn the water on. Once you get that water going, though, you have to wet your hands before you apply soap. A lot of people get that wrong. They just go straight for the soap. You have to wet your hands first because otherwise the soap doesn't distribute well. Um, it clumps up in one area on your skin and it doesn't distribute. So that's actually a tested checkpoint. Wet your hands first. So we're going to wet our hands. We're going to apply soap and we're going to rub all surfaces. So when we rub all surfaces, take this off here. When we rub all surfaces, I'm going to start out with the palm of my hand. I want to keep my hands lower than my elbows, not up lower than my elbows, over the sink. I'm going to rub the palms of my hands. I'm going to rub the top of my wrists, circling it, both sides. I'm going to rub the backs of my hands in between my fingers, just like this. I'm going to rub this area between my thumb and index finger. Okay, so this area. This has got all kinds of little nooks and crannies and skin folds and stuff. You want to make sure you get that area really well. Same thing here. This area gets missed by everybody. When we wash our hands, we don't think about the bottom of our pinky, and yet that's what's set on all the surfaces. So they need to see you wash the bottom of your hand, the palm and pinky area. So we're going to wash there, and then we're going to wash the palms of our hands in between our fingers. Usually when you go to the bathroom, you get some soap, you do this, and then you're done. That's only about a quarter of what you need to wash. So wet hands, get some soap, start rubbing them together, tops of the wrists. I do everything in threes. One, two, three. One, two, three. 
one, two, three, 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 one, two, three. Okay, good. Once you've done all of that, that needs to take at least 20 seconds. If it didn't take 20 seconds, then you better rub your hands some more. It has to take at least 20 seconds. 20 seconds. <clears throat> once you've done that, once you're done with your 20 seconds, you're going to take your thumb and go down each one of your nails to clean your cuticles. And then you're going to circle your nails on the palm of your hand to clean underneath your nails. Then you can rinse. When you rinse, don't touch the inside of the sink or the faucet. Those areas are not clean. So when you rinse, keep your hands in the water only. Once you're done rinsing, don't shake. <laughs> this is going to be the hardest thing for some of you guys to overcome. Don't shake. You want to tap. When you tap, you keep the water confined to the sink area. When you shake, that water goes everywhere. Now, pathogens need three things to thrive. Warm, dark, moist. Bathrooms are usually a few degrees warmer than other environments because we don't like to be chilled when we get out of the shower. So the air that flows into the bathroom is actually restricted. So the bathrooms don't get as cold. So we already have warm. Mom trained you, turn the lights off in the bathroom when you leave. So we already have dark. When you do this, you add pockets of moisture all over that area. Now, bacteria, guys, we go drop bacteria off every day in the bathroom, okay? So that bacteria now has little pockets that it can proliferate that you're going to walk through. And then you take those pathogens all over your workplace setting and even worse, home with you on the bottom of your shoes. So by doing this and keeping the moisture confined in that sink, it's actually an infection control measure. Okay, so try really hard not to shake your hands. I know it's a habit we all have, but try to tap to keep that water confined to the sink. Please don't dry your hands like this. Okay? Your uniform is not clean. We're going to talk about that on Wednesday, but your uniform is not clean. So once you tap, we're going to get some paper towels, whatever you need. If you got small hands, get two. If you got big hands, get 10. Nobody cares. Nobody's counting. If you remember, I told you three, three hours ago that in the waiting room, there was going to be a debate. And there probably will be a debate because some videos out there tell people, five paper towels. Some people tell people four paper towels. Some videos tell people 10 paper towels. It doesn't matter. There's no checkpoint that grades the number of paper towels you use. So just get what you need. But when you dry, only dry what's clean. So I'm going to dry here. I probably got some water that splashed up here. I don't want to bring the paper towel up here and then back down here, because remember, this is not clean. So dry what's clean. Throw that paper towel away, and then you'll get a clean, dry paper towel to turn the faucet off. Okay, not a wet one. Wet paper towels rip. The faucet is the dirtiest thing in the bathroom. We touch it with dirty hands all the time. It's covered with pathogens. If you use that white paper towel to turn the faucet off and that paper towel rips, it can accidentally contaminate your hands and you'll never know it. But you will take it to your patient. Okay. Good. Questions? Okay. So let me show you some frequently missed areas. Now this came from the CDC. They've done lots of studies on this because apparently they have money to study stuff like this. But the areas that are most frequently missed on the back of the hand, um, for some reason, we tend to get our pinky pretty well, but the back of the index finger and the back of the thumb gets missed a lot. This area, the back of the thumb, uh, it's like we don't even know it's there. 
I don't know why. So we want to make sure that we're paying really good attention. Now we do pretty good with the um, palm of our hand. We do pretty good there, but the back of the hand gets missed a lot. So make sure that you're paying attention to the backs of your hands. And that's why we have that process I showed you. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and show you the video now. This only takes like, I don't know, a minute. When you approach the sink, you can touch the faucet with your unclean hands because the faucet is considered the dirtiest object in the bathroom. Adjust the water temperature for comfort and wet your hands. Apply soap and rub all surfaces of your hands vigorously, focusing on the front and back of your hands and in between all fingers. Circle the top of your wrists as well. Friction is the key to removing all pathogens from the surface of your skin. Friction should be applied for at least 20 seconds to be effective. After washing with friction, the nails must be cleaned. Run one thumb down the length of each nail, starting at the cuticle, and moving toward the end of the nail. Repeat with all fingers of both hands. Then clean under your nails by scrubbing the underside of your nails along your palm to remove debris. Carefully rinse your hands under the stream of water with your fingertips pointing downwards taking care not to touch the inside of the sink or the faucet. Tap your fingers together to ensure that all water droplets remain in the sink. Take paper towels from the paper towel dispenser and dry all surfaces of your hands, the front, back, between your fingers, and your wrists, taking care not to allow the paper towels to touch the unwashed areas of your lower arms. Throw these paper towels directly into the trash bin. Finally, Take a clean, dry paper towel to turn the faucet off because wet paper towels may rip and recontaminate your hands. All right. Any questions on hand washing? That uh, video is available on the website. It's also in the course. So if you... Um, Want to rewatch it at all? You can. And I'll show you again on Wednesday as well. Once we start getting into skills, you'll see hand washing a couple of times. So in the online course, you'll see for once we get into skills, um, this is a screenshot from that online course. There's up at the top, above the video, this is the video you just watched. It's in the online course, but above it, you'll see care plan and it brings up the actual care plan. Um, so you can look at the care plan if you need a review. And then it also will bring up the checklist as well. So this is all built into the course. And that's why I said it's interactive. Um, you'll also, you have the video there that you can watch. Um, and then there's going to be an activity shouldn't say closing. It should say hand washing. Um, you'll also see an interactive activity. So let's do this together. Um, so out of these eight steps, what do you think is the first step for hand washing? So we want to turn the water on. Okay. What's the next step? Wet your hands. Good. Okay. What's the next step? Apply soap. What's the next step? Lather. Lather. I like that. Okay. What else? 
Okay, yeah. We need to rub for at least 20 seconds and then rinse. Okay, and? Okay. So, yep, dry our hands and then um, turn it off with a clean, dry paper towel. Okay, so let's see if we got it right. And we did. Gold star. Yay. I just practiced. Oh, good. Very good. Very good. So it, what it does, each one of these skills um, is going to have an activity like this. Now, um, this only has eight steps. So you saw eight steps. But for bigger skills, you're going to have multiple sections. Um, of drag and drop activities to put them all in the right order. And this gets really, really helpful when we get into the really big skills. So if you get used to using it in the small skills, it'll make using it in the bigger skills easier. All right, so page 46 talks to you about uh, hand washing simulation. And we actually talked about this a little bit earlier. After the first skill, the evaluator will tell you you can simulate hand washing from that point. Simulate just means say, I would wash my hands now. But it sure saves a lot of time for the test. All right, let's talk a little bit about indirect care. I got two minutes. <laughs> indirect care can be um, summed up in how you treat the patient. And the easiest way to remember this is treat the patient the way you would want to be treated if you were the one in the bed. So how much should you tell the patient? As much as you can. It's their body. We're helping them. So the more detailed we are, the better off it is for them. And that's how you get patient um, compliance. Patients are way more compliant if they understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. Okay. So treat your patient well. But, um, and indirect care is graded, by the way. Remember I told you we'd come back to that? I told you that these checkpoints have indirect care baked right in. Um, that's going to be important because the main checklists don't have indirect care. I had to put it together for you. So this, when you're in here playing around, this has indirect care built right in. But indirect care can um, be summed up in these points. Eye contact. Remember, half of our job is observation and reporting. If you're not making eye contact, you're not observing. Tone of voice. The way we greet people, the way we talk to them is going to count. Rate of speech. You don't want to go in there talking real fast. You want to make sure that you slow down and that the patient's able to understand what you're saying and how you're saying it. Facial expression, body language, your explanations, your posture, and your attitude all count under indirect care. So we have to be aware of all of this. Good? Questions? All right. Remember your homework. You're going to read chapter one in the white er, in the yellow book. Take the test on page 181 in the white book, the spiral book, and you're going to grade it. So this just goes through that again, grade it. And then once you've graded it, when you come back to class on Wednesday, I'll get your grades. And if you have any questions, if you don't know why the right answer is the right answer, please ask. I'd be happy to explain it. I need to get you your review sheets. Don't go anywhere. I have a review sheet for you. And... Here's your next steps. So you can go ahead and read that while I get your review sheet. I always give you a review sheet at the end of each class that sums up everything that we did in class that day. You'll find that they're very helpful reviews. But it does take a second to print, so give me a second. I know I'm going to be a minute late, sorry. Um, does anybody have any questions? Did I go too fast? Am I? Did I overwhelm anybody? Am I giving you too much information at one time? Is it organized in a way that you can go home and do your homework? Is everybody coming back on Wednesday? <laughs> I don't want to scare anybody off. 
Remember, this is your class. I'm just here to help you with it, okay? Um, so if you have a problem, if you have a question, please make sure that you let me know. I'm here for you. You will need to bring your blood pressure cuffs and your stethoscopes to class on, um, on Wednesday. Uh, and if you have some sort, something that you can wrap the blood pressure cuff around that's um, like a can, not a water bottle. This thing, if you wrap the blood pressure cuff, the top will come off and it'll look like a volcano. Um, but like a, a Lysol can or something like that. I have several, but I don't know if I have 14. Um, and we're still missing two. So um, don't know if they're going to come or not. But if you've got something, bring it in. Scrubbing bubbles can or Lysol or something like that will work. And um, we're going to learn blood pressure on Wednesday. Wednesday is a very big day, very big day. So, um, you know, eat your meaties before you come in. All right, let me pass this out. Uh, Nicholas, please don't leave before you. Uh, I, got, I need to verify something with you. So there's one for you. There's one for you. Yeah. yeah, like a can. Just something to wrap your blood pressure cup around to practice inflating and deflating. Oh, little are too small. Um, I never use a pool noodle. That's a good idea. Bring one or dry it. Just, nope, that's just for you. Oh. It's, it's just the review sheet. Oh. Just the review sheet. Well, basically, you want us to use something to bring something that we, would be your arm. Right, right, yeah. about the size of an arm. Yeah, because we're going to practice inflating and deflating the cup. I can take it in just one second. I'll be happy to take it. Okay. Okay. Are we good? You're good. You are Thank free you. to go. You're welcome. Oh, yep. Oh, that's the extras. Okay. All right. It's best not to have one that connects. That. It's best to do like a more of a professional one. This one is good for self blood pressure but not really good for um, taking it on somebody else. Okay. Yeah, more of a more of a more of a professional one. I don't have one readily available. If you hang out just a minute, I'll be happy to help you. Okay. Let me uh let me get my screen here.